Um, so another way to do it, uh, we always find ways to overcomplicate things, is to add modems. Um, so here we are, um, this is the same circuit as before, but we are adding to a uh, transformer to couple um, uh, a PLC communication, a power line communication. communication. Um, this is all described in the 1511.8 standard. Uh, before it was uh, uh, the DIN 771 uh, it was an American standard. Then it became 1511.8 uh, when uh, ISO adopted it. And then it's evolving, but basically the standard covers all of the uh, uh, Aussie layers, um, ISO Aussie layers, and uh, there are many, many parts of this standard that describe a lot of uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, things that the car need to do and the charger need to do to communicate. Uh, just the 1511.8-20 it is uh, uh, 567 pages long. And that's only for the upper layer protocols. So it's a bit complex. Uh, by the way, uh, so here's, um, so, so we just use uh, power line communication modems. Uh, what's that? It's uh, um, a modem that's uh, uh, input outputting a signal out at, uh, on the band of 1 to 30 megahertz. Uh, on the pilot line, overlaid over the one kilohertz pilot. And it's usually, uh, to explain it to non-technical people, I said it's just wired Wi-Fi. In fact, you can just uh, uh, pick it up with uh, this radio receiver and listen to it with a speaker. <laughs> and uh, a tiny downside of this uh, standard is that there are only three chips available in the market today. Uh, but you can find it. Uh, you can find these chips in uh, power line devices like this one um, that you can use to uh, move Ethernet from one side to the other of your house uh, via, via the power line. So you plug it in to your wall socket, and you, you can transfer. You can have basically a slow Ethernet connection, uh, a slow and unstable Ethernet connection. So uh, a lot of uh, let's say um, uh, low budget hackers uh, use. This uh, kind of devices, they hacked it to remove the coupling to the AC uh, and uh, just uh, um, connected it to the uh, pilot signal of the car uh, and the Raspberry to uh, experiment with those protocols. So once we have your modem um, on our um, the, the on, on our wires, um, we need to uh, start. Uh, negotiating with a car, how to speak, how to talk. Um, and uh, we start with a slack. So we have a characterization of a signal attenu attenuation. We play a lot of tones on the uh, whole frequencies and measure the response uh, with a car to try and establish a good connection. Uh, and we measure the strength of a, of a tone and we generate a profile of the attenu attenuation um, of what we talk uh, of a, of a of a bus. Uh, so now we are uh, in a LAN. The VM, the AVC are connected at uh, hoping uh, 3 to 10 megabits per second. And what's next? Well, you heard of Slack. Now you have Slack. That's uh, the stateless auto address configuration. So basically, we don't do DHCP here. Uh, every device chooses its own uh, uh, IP address. Uh, that's derived uh, from the MAC address, uh, so it's it's a whole protocol in an RFC. It's a standard, but um, of course um, we have one charger and one car, but we need to be future proof. Uh, so you never know. Maybe in the future you connect more than four billion cars to a single charger. So we do IPv6, of course. And okay, now we have uh, this nice communication channel open with a car, and uh, we have uh, um, a bunch of stuff and uh, talk with a car. Oh, by the way, you don't talk to the car, the car talks to you. So the car sends you messages and then you can answer it, but you don't initiate the communication with the car. So um, that's okay, I guess. Uh, 
Uh, that's one another thing to keep in mind. Um, and then we have some uh, XML schemas uh, for how we go and uh, and talk to the car. What are the parameters? Uh, what um, uh, what what the car can ask and what can uh, what we need to answer it to have a successful charging station charging session, but this is too easy. Um, so um, well, we and also it's way too big. So we went through all the effort to to build a, a fast communication with the car, um, but this is too big. Uh, XML or JSON maybe uh, is uh, is just too big. So we use uh, XE. XE st stands for Efficient XML Interchange Format. Uh, and it's basically an encoder and decoder that can take, uh, let's say, um, an XML request of around 700 bytes to around uh, 30, 40 bytes. Um, and we compress the data, so it's a bit harder to, uh, to implement. And, uh, uh, and it's more efficient uh, to transmit and receive the data um, and to interpret it, let's say. Uh, why do we do it? Because it's sexy. <laughs> so, um, okay, now we have uh, this kind of communication. Uh, we have a, an open communication channel with a car and uh, we can do a lot of fun stuff like this or this or this. Um, but basically, um, the new standard defines these use cases. So we have uh, AC charging or DC charging. And on inside these cases, you have all the information from the car, like the uh, uh, status, the, the state of charge, um, uh, what the car is capable of taking, what uh, the, the charging station is capable of. Uh, then we have uh, WPT, that's wireless power transfer. Um, and there's also um, a standard, the 1508-8, that uh, tells you how to communicate via Wi-Fi to the car. And that's another can of worms. Uh, and then we have DC ACDP. ACDP is, uh, stands for, um, uh, I don't remember the, the acronym, but it's just it's for uh, pantographs. So you have a moving robotic connection like a pantograph going to uh, uh, a high voltage line. And uh, there are two um, use cases defined for that, uh, the DC ACDP and the BPT. BPT is directional bidirectional power transfer. So uh, it also specifies a, a set of messages and a set of uh, instructions to, to initiate and uh, have a working uh, bidirectional power transfer uh, session. Um, so why did we go through all this effort to to get this connection? Um, well, the standard, as I said, is uh, like 600 pages long. Um, and there it uh, describes uh, a lot of things. The, the, the most interesting thing, let's say, the, the, the thing that Everybody, the holy grail, let's say, uh, is a uh, plug and charge. Uh, so basically, you have your, um, let's say, your card. Your car is like acts like a credit card, and uh, you have certification, uh, a lot of certificates going on. Um, so you can I initiate uh, a charging session, and uh, the the charging station will tell you uh, what is the current tariff and uh, present you a list of uh, uh, providers for your current uh, for your charging session uh, you may have uh, uh, subscribed to one or more of them or um, and then you can have uh, a variable cost of the energy and all this data is sent to the car somehow um, well the, the car has only it's 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 opinable the u the usefulness of this um, because the car should just get in my opinion uh, should just tell us uh, hey I'm a car I have a battery and uh, this is the characteristic of the battery this is what you can do to me this is how you ca how we can uh, do this charging session 
and then all the other details should be left to, uh, I don't know, another platform, uh, um, another user interface. But you get all this kind of data uh, sent to the car, and uh, we will see what car will do uh, in the next future with all this data. Um, so if you want to start playing with uh, this kind of stuff, um, uh, UHI22, Yui, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, uh, did a lot of research and a lot of uh, documentation, uh, especially about using um, uh, commercial power line devices uh, to communicate with the vehicles. Um, and he also wrote a lot of software, a lot of software to cover all the, to cover a lot of, of the 1511.8 standard, uh, with the goal of making an issue to uh, that you can put in your car to emulate uh, a car, and he's working on a, a car conversion, so he's developing the car side. Uh, on the other side, we have Everest. It's another cool open source uh, framework uh, that's. Um, that implements most of the stuff that you need for an AVC, AVSC to talk to a vehicle. And uh, if you want to look at the standard, I recommend uh, using the Estonia Center for Standardization. That's a uh, European uh, standard. Uh, th the standards are European, and Estonia is part of Europe. And you can get really cheap standards from them. And you can also pay like three euros to uh, have a 24-hour license to read the standard and maybe download it if you're a pirate, but I, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, and yeah, what what I wanted to tell you uh, is, what I wanted to do is give a brief, brief introduction of this really complex topic, and, uh, um, and I wanted to maybe inspire you uh, to participate in the writing of standards you care about, uh, otherwise you end up with uh, this. Thank you. <laughs> um. I don't know, do we have time for questions? Are there questions? Okay. <laughs> Uh, do you have a experience of the compatibility of the cars with the AC charging combined with the PLC communication? Uh, yes. Um, well, compatibility of cars is uh, another can of worms. So basically, you have this standard. You can uh, you can write your own software to uh, to communicate very well with a simulator that implements the standard uh, as is written in the standard. But of course, uh, on the OEM side, it's a total mess. Mm -hmm. So you have to implement many, many tiny special cases. Um, we uh, the, the user the usual way to do AC charging with 1511.8-2. Uh, that's what most ca uh, vehicles are capable of. Is to start a DC charging session to get the data from the car. Like you get the state of charge. You get uh, what kind of battery it's mm -hmm. there. Um, and some more information from the car, and then you stop the DC charging session, and you start uh, a normal, classic, stupid AC charging session, and then you derive your data from there, uh, so you know the capacity of a battery, and you know how much you're charging it, and you can roughly estimate a SOC uh, state of charge in uh, when you're charging. Um, I haven't tested any AC 1518-20 AC chargers, uh, vehicles, uh, I'm mostly doing experiments with uh, DC and bidirectional DC. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. No. So, if you want to start the uh, charging in a public infrastructure, uh, you need two things basically. Uh, what is the connector? But this is known on that charger, but the other thing is who, as a person, is in the car and uh, is uh, want, want to start the charging. What, what are your uh, experience with uh, this question, like solving the who is uh, starting the, the charging? Do, do, you, do you have any uh, experience with this? 
Uh, not directly. Well, the standard specifies uh, the plug and charge uh, protocol uh, to identify a user and exchange uh, contract information and uh, have a chain of signatures uh, to, let's say, buy a charging session, to pay for a charging session. Um, I think that uh, at the moment uh, you can associate the car uh, with uh, the network, so the idea of a car uh, to the network. Uh, there's a uh, um, there's object that's um, the main root of trust certificate holder and has all the uh, framework in place uh, to uh, release all certificates downstream. Um, and uh, basically you sign a contract with uh, uh, a charging station operator, charging point operator, and uh, you provide your uh, details and the car um, gets identified then. It's Thanks. Hello. Hi. You you know I have a, um, a plugin hybrid and with a um, remote starter like illegal for Norway. But the, when I have the connector plug, you said that I can remove one pin and it will allow me to start remotely. If you, you know about that. Uh, what, what do you mean? You want to start no, your I, car? I, I have the remote starter like a you know a hack. Uh huh. But it doesn't work if it's the connect if the thing is plugged to the. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can remove uh, the pilot pin. But then you also need to make sure that you don't drive away with your car connected. So one of the pins, uh, the. Uh, is, is it that stupid that he hmm? still continues charging, but it will not. It will stop charging. Ah, okay, okay. It okay. it will just detect the cable as unplugged. Uh, it depends on the implementation of the vehicle, but you may need to unplug both of them, both the CP and PP, to uh, make the car think that you don't have a connector connected. Uh, yeah. Okay. But don't do it. <laughs> 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 All right. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> um, to what extent do you think the complexity and terribleness of this standard is due to the influence of legacy auto trying to slow down EV adoption? Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, I have opinions. Uh, well, there's a company that was able to achieve plug and charge, and it works. I, I don't have data, but let's say 99% of the time. Uh, while uh, with this standard, up until recently, now it's getting better, but uh, up until recently there were um, a huge amount of failed charging stations. Um, you know, it always depends on who writes the standard and what is their motivation for doing it. Uh, the 15 and 8 was a, is a very old standard. Um, it was published before anyone cared about electric mobility. Um, so one may, one people that, uh, if you think badly of people, you may think that uh, someone that is against electrification may have made it uh, uh, harder than it needs to be, uh, just to give a better, uh, a worse experience to people, so people will uh, not like electric cars, or just to add more, obstacles to the electric electrification. But it's up to you what you think. Hi. Um, here. Hi. Um, it seems like a very complex uh, protocol. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been thinking, how likely is for a malicious, malicious actor to oh, yeah. uh, provide some kind of attack with this protocol, like spoofing of someone's car credentials, mm -hmm. or uh, somehow uh, use it to inject code into the charging system, either the car or the charging station. 
Yeah, thank you for your question. That's a really important topic I forgot to talk about, let's say. Um, so, well, it's hugely complex and you're basically, uh, uh, OEMs are running it on microcontrollers uh, inside the car and uh, the ECU responsible for this is directly connected to the CAN bus of the car. Uh, must be, because it needs to communicate with a battery. Uh, so, yeah, it's a really interesting uh, vector of attack. Uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> and also, uh, due to the sheer complexity of this, uh, you basically need to have a Linux, uh, um, a charging station running Linux. Uh, so that's another point of interesting point of uh, attack. Uh, when you have many charging station all connected to the internet, uh, that can be uh, updated uh, with uh, packages that have uh, mechanisms for auto updates, uh, and that can then talk to vehicles. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Right. Thanks very much. That's a great talk. Thank you. Hi, stay tuned a couple seconds. We'll have Becky Button up here talking about distortion on purpose.
everybody, welcome back. Making guitar pedals or instrument pedals or distortion pedals or whatever was kind of what got me into hacking on electronics as a kid. So it's got a soft spot in my heart. These days, everything is done, not everything. These days, it's possible to do really awesome things digitally, where previously it was all analog electronics. But it takes a bunch of people to make them. So with that in mind, we'll have Becky's talk here, the people of the purple pedal takes a tribe. Next, so please join me in welcoming to the Hackaday Europe stage, Becky Button. Uh, well, thank you so much, Elliot, for giving that introduction. Um, today, I'll be talking about all the people that um, helped contribute to the purple pedal. If you don't know about the purple pedal, the purple pedal is a guitar effects pedal that I made with my friends Jason Garwin and Rowan Dunlop. Um, and it started like any good engineering project with um, bad math and a lot of unmet <laughs> expectations. It was senior year of, um, it was the, the summer, sorry. It was registration week my senior year and I had this vision that I was gonna make a Moog synthesizer um, and get my school, Carnegie Mellon, to pay for it. And um, I thought this was a great plan. I thought this was, you know, made a lot of sense for Carnegie Mellon to do that. But that did not happen um, because it was too expensive. So I had to come up with a new, th new plan for how I was going to use these research credits um, to make something fun. Um, while this was all happening, um, my guitar broke, and I had to go to the guitar shop. And I talked to this guy. Uh, I don't remember his name, but I, I, I was pretty much in that guitar shop for like two hours just playing with pedals. And it, it was like the heavens opened up. Um, time, and, time and space didn't make any sense. Um, I was being called, I was being compared to Jimmy Page. It was just like a really crazy experience and I figured might as well make a pedal. So um, I talked to my advisor, they were like, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, and I started making a pedal and this began my first phase of pedal making, which was research. Um, I didn't really know where to start and so I looked at people who were kind of related or at my university and um, the first person I talked to was this guy, Jesse Stiles. He was an assistant professor at CMU. And his, his idea was you should start using a daisy seed because it is really fast and good for music applications. And I said, that's a good idea. I'll, I'll try playing with that. And so every Tuesday, we'd meet up, and I'd tell him my problems, and he'd uh, help me as best he could. The next person I talked to was Tom Zydell. Um, he was an assistant professor in the EC department. He's like, you should document your process. And there's some advice that you just don't really follow until <laughs> the end. Um, it was good, but I, I didn't think about it in the moment. Um, as I was building this, I was playing around with things in my university. And I was also looking at um, kind of where were artists going and, and learning and playing with these pedals out in the wild. And I went to this meetup called Experimental Guitar Night, and it was at this place called the Government Center. And there was a bunch of people like playing with all sorts of instruments, um, and they had pedal boards that were huge. Some people had two pedal boards going, and I was like, whoa, I could be a performer. I could do this. So I started asking people around, and somehow I ended up on the next um, set list for Experimental Guitar Night. Um, and it was also there that I got the idea to play with things that weren't guitars um, and try to make them sound really strange. So that started my next phase, which was actually doing stuff um, and getting feedback on it. Um, like I mentioned, at Experimental Guitar Night, somebody had the idea that I should play with things that weren't guitars. So I found a tin on the side of the street, screw a bunch of holes in it, and put a p uh, transducer on it, and I started putting that through a bunch of filters to see what happened. And um, I started bringing this to a meetup in my city called uh, Pittsburgh Sound Preserve. And the lot, a lot of the feedback I'd get was something like, have you thought about this? Have you 
maybe you should add this feature. This, this kind of sucks about your board. Like, you should try to fix this. Um, and that was a long process of just going every other week, playing something. Sometimes it'd work, sometimes it wouldn't. Um, and eventually, my set at Experimental Guitar Night happened, and this is the only documentation I have from it. <laughs> um, um, but it was great. Like, half the things worked, half the things didn't. Um, at this stage, it was a very complicated control box, and this tin box I had showed on the other um, slide, it had a drum loop, it had a sensor that reacted to the environment. It was very, very disorganized. Like, it was just, it was, it was a lot. And my friend, Jason, at the end of it was like, that was great but it could be a lot simpler. So um, naturally, like any good project, I forgot about it for four months, and I just didn't do anything. And then one day, I got an email <laughs> from Hackaday saying my workshop was accepted, and I had an oh shit moment where I was like, what am I gonna do? I don't have a pedal. So I called my friends, and we came up with a plan. Um, and that started phase three, actually make a guitar pedal. So we all got on a phone call, <laughs> and um, our plan was very simple. Uh, design the guitar pedal, create a curriculum, test it out, and iterate. Um, our first workshops were held in Brooklyn, um, the first of which was at um, New York City Resistor. Um, my friend Becky Stern hooked us up, and we got a couple people going on the pedal. Um, and then the next one was actually the next day, and it was at Coney Island Maker Fair, and we had 12 people show up. And during the workshop, ooh, let's see if we can get this video playing. Um, people, how do I play a video? Okay, figured it out. So during the workshop, uh, people got fully functioning phasers going. And it sounds really cool, I promise. Um, so <laughs> what we learned from this process, though, was like how to collaborate because we weren't physically located in the same place. Me and Jason j were in two different cities and we were doing something very physical and we couldn't physically be together. So we had to figure out like how we, we would call as we did the manufacturing um, process. We also figured out like the logistics behind making a bunch of kits because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things you have to think about in terms of like deadlines and, and getting things in on time. Um, the audio is working, so I'll play you a little bit clip of what happened. Somebody brought a synth and ran it through the pedal. Okay. That's fine. Um, and our conclusion was at the end of this workshop is that there was still a lot of things that we could make better in terms of how we explain things and, and you know, features of the board. So we got back to work, um, and we went to Supercon and created another iteration of the board, and there's all my friends uh, there, and we taught a bunch of people how to make it, and it was a good experience. Um, we started to focus more on like how do we get more people involved that aren't necessarily hackers, and so um, I started working with one of my friends who's um, a performance artist and is in the theater, and she, oh no. Okay, well, <laughs> she did a performance art piece, I'll link it later, um, where she used the pedal, and it was a really interesting experience, like seeing um, what kind of things she needed, what kind of things I had, and what, how to bridge those kind of gaps. Next. Um, and that brings us to where I am now, which was continuing to make a pedal in Berlin. So um, I came to Berlin on March 29th, and on April 1st, I was in x working on the pedal, and I was working through some filter issues. I wanted to see if I could make the sound sound a little bit better, because, you know, that matters when you're doing audio stuff. And um, somebody thought it would be funny if um, we made a pedal that was shaped like a foot. So um, I... I designed a pedal shaped like a foot with one of my friends who I met in Berlin. Um, I guess all that to say, um, talk about your ideas with people. There was at least 72 people who were involved in making this pedal. Um, thank you so much.
Thank you very much. Sorry that the audio didn't work on your demos. It is what it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks tons. Does anyone have any questions real quick? So. So do you still use uh, um, um, seat or microcontroller or is it all analog? No. I still use the daisy seat because there's just so much um, digital signal processing libraries available. I'm curious if you have alternative thoughts. No. No? OK. <laughs> yeah, I still use the daisy seat. I've, I have had issues with, um, in the newest version, they swapped out like a codec. And I've been having issues with filtering out noise from that. But, but um, yeah, I'd love to talk to you after this, actually, about that. Uh, what what voltages did you have to work with, and were you afraid to blow any amplifier or any expensive music equipment? How did you not I, break anything expensive? How did I not break anything expensive? Um, everything's pretty much a little bit below line level, so it's pretty low voltages. A lot of times, like what in the early days, I was actually not. It wasn't loud enough um, because. It wasn't loud enough. Um, so it was actually pretty easy to avoid it just because I was kind of just working directly off the daisy seed pins. If I had played with like an amplifier, I could have probably done some crazy things. Um, but there's so many parts of the audio tool chain that I think wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been a big issue if it was really, really loud. That's my, that's my thought. Thank you very much. That was really great. You can probably unmute your laptop and try the demo again. Oh. Oh, yeah? Oh, cool. A simple yeah, we have the time. press of the button. Where is it? Uh -huh. um, oh, it was muted. OK. All right. Let's go back. Um, so here's an audio clip from the first workshop. And you can hear it sounds kind of metallic. Um, and then here, you know what, since we have time, I am going to just request the access and go through it. Let's see. Share. Okay, let's see. It should be shared. Let's see. Um, I'm not really sure. How do I go back? No, nope, OK. Okay, you'll have to believe me. <laughs> okay, yeah, send everybody a link. F5? Command R. Actually, it's Command and R. Mm. Oh, great, awesome. Um, so here's my friend's uh, performance art piece that was made with the pedal. So she's reading from her diary and she's um, using light, the light sensor to um, create noise when for parts she doesn't want people to hear. So there's parts you can hear and there's parts of it that are very inaudible because of the noise. Um, and it's, she's talking about like body image and stuff and she's, she's doing great things. <laughs> Cool, thanks very much.
in welcoming to the Hagaday Europe stage, Thomas Pollock, to talk about Poly Keyboard. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, um, my name is Thomas, and I want today to talk about the Poly Keyboard. And as already mentioned, it has displays in its keycaps. Um, and before we dive into the um, details, uh, let's start at the very beginning. So it was 2020, we had COVID, and I thought, okay, yeah, let's make something. And just coincidentally, I had uh, this tiny displays lying around at the table. They were 15 by 50 millimeters, so that's a 0 0.49 inch OLED display with I square C. And I was wondering, hmm, w would that actually fit into a keycap? Um, that looks very close, like a keycap 1U is 19 point something millimeter. Maybe, maybe that works. So would it, would it actually fit in? And then when it fits, then how many of these displays can we actually address? One, two, 70, 100? I don't know. And then I'll... Uh, Sure, somebody already did that, right? So these were my first thoughts, and it was from there it was a step-by-step -step process. Okay, let's let's try to figure out. So would it fit? So I made a design with my 3D printer. I printed in some clear PETG, and yeah, it kind of fits, not not exactly. So you can see that the PCB sticks out a little bit. And you cannot, you know, really make a nice keycap, but yeah, close. So that's my my first three D printed prototype. Um, yeah. And then, how about addressing these? So as I said, these were uh, I square C displays. So first, great, I can address them, right? But unfortunately, they all have the same address. <laughs> and you can only, only choose one of two addresses with a resistor on the PCB. So that doesn't work. So I, I thought, OK, if I maybe can just somehow mute the clock signal, not every display is listening, then it will not update, right? So I thought maybe I can use some kind of multiplexer just to select the clock lines on the right displays. And in the end, I instead of a multiplexer, I settled for a shift register because it just needs two pins, like I can input serial data and it will just output the clock lines on the displays I wanted to. And I tried that out with a little Arduino and uh, it worked. So, okay, sounds like that addressing is not an issue. So here we can see all all of these uh, displays have different numbers there. Yeah. And uh, then, okay, but you know, this is nothing new, right? Or is it? So, no, no, it is not. So, this has been here before, like, I don't know, now maybe already 30 or more year, 40 years. The idea is around long time. This is like the, the first keyboard with an LCD display uh, in the key. Um, that's a very famous one, also like 20 years maybe already ago, the Optimus Maximus. And there were other iterations which have um, like a LCD screen on the back, but what they do have in common, that the key press is awkward. So when the, when the screen is behind the, the keys, you actually have like a transparent key and when you press, there it has to be su suspended somehow. Or also in the case of, of the second one, um, the, the key press was really hard to do. So my objective somehow was, okay, first make it work as a keyboard and then let it display something. Because if, the, if it's not, you know, if you cannot work on it, if you cannot type on it, why do it? And I think this is maybe, or this is my explanation why these approaches actually didn't work or do not work. Um, but the other makers, you know, they pretty much doing the same like I I do. They started around the same time and they more or less succeeded um, with some uh, resin casted uh, keycaps. They're pretty, but you know, resin casting 100 keycaps is not always fun. So it's a hard process. I wanted to have something easier. 
And um, just as a fun fact, um, so these little displays, um, you can see this Lego, Lego brick. So, you know, the, the resolution is enough, for instance, to play Doom on it, right? So, it's, you know, it's good enough to do a lot of stuff on these little displays. Yeah, and the uh, most common application these days is actually like these stream decks, but again, it's the same thing. Why you're not using that as, as keyboard? Because it feels strange when you press the button. So it, for me, it was like, okay, let's, let's go on. You know, they all maybe made a mistake. Let's see. So how can we improve this now? I, I know it doesn't look great, but um, I was looking for a better display or for a little bit smaller. And here it is. So there was a 0 0.42 inch OLED display and it just had 11 by 12 millimeters. So that sounded like, yeah, smaller. So it should fit this time. And it had an SPI interface. So there was no problem actually, you know, selecting the right chips. The only strange thing, it had a 3.8 voltage uh, power supply. Okay, well, you cannot get everything, I thought. Okay, let's try this. And um, I used um, these clear keycaps from cash registers because they usually on cash registers in any supermarket, they have like these little stickers and then they put a clear keycap on it and you can see through and you can display whatever you want. And I thought, okay, let's, let's use that. And... Um, yeah, they fit it into. Um, so I just made a little slot with my soldering iron and then I cut it out with a knife to get the cable through and yeah. So I had a resolution here with 72 by 40 pixels and I can put them into this uh, real legendable keycaps. Um, there was just a little problem. So you can see if it sticks out of the key switch, it's a bit short. <laughs> almost there um, but yeah okay but uh, some success L let's go on let's you know that's another step okay better than before um, and I already hinted it in the last screenshot a little bit um, so there is this little slit in this uh, key switches and they were actually the slits for for LEDs because you can light up your keyboard with RGB LEDs and the the cable um can fit through that slit um under some circumstances Let, let's come to that um not for everyone some of the key switches there's a little bar which you have to cut away and also this 16 pin um screen the oled screen was just a half millimeter too wide for most most of the switches so i had just to you know, remove a little bit of plastic left and right, and then it was working. But for now, it was like, okay, yeah, let's let's continue. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I can do that now. Maybe there's something around later. At least um, was working. And I uh, made an, uh, another prototype, and you know, made all the circuitry that was first on the PCB. So I, because I just had a, a display now, and I hooked it up to a ESP32. And um, because I wanted to use QMK as firmware, I switched to STM32. Suddenly all STM32s were sold out or you had to pay 70 euro uh, for one. So <laughs> Luckily there was the Raspberry Pi 2040 just uh, coming. It was really cheap. So once again, I switched um, the MCU. And yeah, this one, this four key switch um, keyboard was already working like a proper keyboard. So you could connect it to your PC and it displayed the individual stuff on each uh, display and you could press the keys. So I was like, okay, good. That's, that's something. Um, but I've still solved the, the flex cable, the FPC, right? So how, how can you make it longer? Because it's too short. So there are these adapters, but you can see they're a little bit clunky. They're it's too big. You, you will not fit that through somewhere. So. I was looking online and not really finding something. Okay, so maybe we can just you know, solder them together. So I tried that. I put some solder paste on both sides, distributed it with a soldering iron, and then made it hot again and um, used some tweezers to squeeze it together. And it works. <laughs> so you can solder together. I mean, Maybe 20% of the displays were dying. Okay, but you know, it's it's fine. 
it's working. So it was time to make a proper PCB. And um, it was the first time for me using KiCad. So I watched some tutorials and um, I felt ready, made a, a full keyboard, and then I already saw, OK, it's a total mess. Um, I have to start from scratch again because I made so many mistakes. And OK, let's, let's start with, with one key. <laughs> and um, OK, that, sh that should work. And yeah, I wanted to be able just to first prove the concept. And so I made this PCB. You can see you can chain it up to eight switches to have eight chip select lines, which are just forward across the PCB to to pick the right display. And of course, it needs a separate controller board. But yeah, one step after each other. And in the end, uh, I ordered uh, a PCB with four of them already attached instead of soldering four together. I felt like, OK, that's a manageable amount. And I, I baked them in my in my old um, not used anymore bread oven. And yeah, it turned out to be working. So I connected it to the controller board. You can see on the side where there are the shift registers. And because I didn't know how long the, the flex cable really needs to be, you can see that's actually too big. The, the this this um, where it attaches to the PCB, there's much too much space. But yeah, f for the beginning, it was fine. And yeah. I could display on four different um, keys, and that was working. So I thought, okay, yeah, now let's extend that. So 20 keys, and also that one was kind of working. Um, once in a while, I had a l this weird glitch. You can see the the display is not showing actually what it should. But yeah, I mean, for me, it was working. You know, I can address maybe later when I'm smarter. <laughs> So okay, let's let's continue. Um, yeah, at least my motivation changed with the exception of the glitches. Um, so I thought, okay, can we maybe make a a keyboard that you know, not only a macro pad or like a little gimmicky? Can we make a full keyboard? And actually, I want to display m different languages. I want to use not only German and English keyboard. I want to use a Korean keyboard as well. And can it maybe display the the shortcuts I never remember in my ID? Was it was it F8 to step into a function? Was it F7? I, uh, every ID is different. And yeah. So can we do that? And I thought, OK, now first experiment was successful. Uh, I try something bigger. So this is one side of a split keyboard now. Um, and uh, I found out there's a, a KiCad uh, plugin that's really helpful that's called Replicate Layout. Basically, just arrange like I could arrange my key switches, and if you have all the circuitry needed for for the displays to work in a uh, in a hierarchy sheet, then you can let just keycut replicate the layout around all the switches, so you don't have to position all the individual components. You so just assign it to the plugin, and then say, okay, place all them, including the tracks, and at least all these things already layouted, and that's a great help because I don't want to do that for every switch again and again. And um, of course, I had to also improve on the software side because um, I had this 8 eight pixel font, but that's just not good enough. So I was looking around, and there was this um, website where you could actually customize a font. And I tried that out a little bit and felt, oh, OK, well, kind of working. But yeah. I mean, you you don't want to create your own pixel font for for every for every language for every font uh, there is maybe out there. So I started to look around, and there's this font generator from Adafruit, and I extended it to support two bytes because if you want to have a display for any agent TypeScript, you need at least two byte characters. So I extended that one, and that works. Um, so I can generate it. And I just use some um, Google fonts which are available for free for like for Japanese, for Korean, uh, for Arabic. So that's rendering beautifully and the two byte character support is enough for that. And so yeah, this is how my first um, PCB there turned out. 
a few <laughs> a few connections were not right, but I was uh, lucky enough to figure out that I twisted two lines and yeah, some other things were not right, but you know, it was manageable, so it was good. And yeah, it it booted up, it showed something, and now it was just manual labor just to, you know, connect um enough uh flex cables with displays and put them all into the switches and um yeah. And finally I had two sides. Why why two left sides? Because if you let um usually if you let some bur manufacture your boards they only let you manufacture two or more. So I thought okay when I make a split keyboard I have two left sides fine. I also can connect them and see if it works, you know, and it gives me the the possibility to the right side do next iteration and you know learn from the mistakes and with that I I can come along. And yeah, there was still this glitch, right? And yeah, I didn't figure it out by myself. I was just talking to a coworker and he said, oh, you, you know, maybe your, your MCU cannot drive 32 displays in parallel. Maybe it's a fan audition. Yeah, he was, he was very right. Um, so because I had all these displays on the same SPI data and clock line and uh, it was too much for, uh, for the RP2040 just to, to get proper signals high and low. And the solution for that is, is um, I added buffers. So every column, every keyboard column has a one bit buffer for the clock and for the, for the data line. Um, so this is the next iteration, to, so to say, and I highlighted here in red, there are these little ones for each column. There are two buffers and with them the glitches are gone. Great. Another one solved. And I was also kind of frustrated um, by the RP20 on the on the board because it had the micro USB and I don't like micro USB. I wanted to have a USB-C and I wanted more, more flash. So I took a look at the data sheets of the RP2040 and it's all open source, it's great. I just copied the design and put it on the board and also it worked, it's great. And um, what else did I change? Um, I added some expansion ports so you can add a rotary encoder or some trackpad, that's the blue one. And um, the first uh, displays I had were like 16 pin uh, flex cables and um, in the meanwhile I was lucky um, so I got a new display so it's the same display as before and I talked to a Chinese manufacturer they said okay you know we can customize the, f the flex cable for you we make it as long as you want and uh, because um, the other one had a touch interface on the flex cable it had 16 pins and I said I don't need the touch interface so there were two pins gone, and with 14 pins, it got one millimeter smaller. And I told you at the beginning, there was this half millimeter I had to, you know, modify the key switches. So now I'm one millimeter smaller, so now I can fit through all the key switches. So you can, you know, pick whatever key switch you want. If it has a, a slit for the RGB LED, you can just insert that one into that, and you're good. So also that problem is now gone. And yeah, now it's um, time to take uh, more focus on the software side because, you know, hardware felt like, oh, yeah, we are pretty close to something that is really working. Um, so I, I wrote a little um, host application because, uh, for instance, when you, when you switch a language or when, when you want to have, a, like, shortcuts uh, for a specific program, actually the host has to tell you what it's set up to, right? So for instance, when I work at a program, it should tell me, oh yeah, use the shortcuts for program A, or by the way, I'm now using German, please, you know, display the German keyboard layout or whatever. So I need some host program that's working. And I use the Python script because it's very easy to, to modify and easy changeable. And uh, finally, it's possible to, to show some overlays. So this is how that looks like. I, I just made an example for, for GIMP, for instance. I just arranged that in a bitmap and uh, then I sliced it with my Python program. And then I just, uh, over the hit interface, um, downloaded it to the keyboard. And 
Yeah, that's how it looks like. And uh, I found it already very useful. I didn't know that GIMP has so many key shortcut keys. So I, I was already happy. Or uh, what about um, some keycard shortcuts? Yeah, you, you can just download it to your, to your keyboard. Um, it's great. Uh, of course, um, this is still a manual process at the moment. So I say, OK, please now download this shortcut map or that shortcut map. But I think you know that could be extended. The, the host program could just you know maybe get the active um, window, whatever it is, and then tell me, okay, yeah, for this you should download that on right away without asking. And you know the keyboard is actually then helping me. That would be great. I mean, this is my vision. That's why I tried to do that. Um, yeah, but yeah, I'm I'm on the way there. So getting there. And I have a, a little um, video that's that's not on the latest version, but it gives you an idea. And I would also encourage you to to drop by. I'm I'm sitting right behind the stairs there, so if you're interested, come and try it out. Oh yeah, okay. We have to change something. Not not that you hear that much, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> So th this is just um, now switching the languages, for instance, Japanese, Korean, Arabic, and of course, uh, also you have to communicate this language change then to the host system. For for German and English, it's not a big deal um, because there are some keys switched. Um, or well, with the exception of, of some umlaut, but um, other languages like Korean or Japanese need some kind of input method because they have to combine characters. So you actually have to notify the host system. By the way, I need another language now. So that's why you need this two-way communication. Okay, um, any questions so far? Okay, then I, I, have, a, I have a little advertisement because um, yeah, um, I've been working on this since 2020, and step by step, you know, try to make it a little bit better. Um, it's it's all up on GitHub, so if you if you want to make it, go there. Software is there, hardware is there, everything you can make it. Um, well, you just have to order it from different sources. Maybe the only tricky part is the display, because you need the the customized ribbon. If you don't want to solder them together, I mean, that's always possible, but it's. it's yeah, <laughs> it's a, a bit of a tricky task. So, uh, yeah, I, I talked to, to Crowd Supply, and if everything works out well, there will be a kit. So, you still you have to put it together. Um, so, it's still fun, and you can still um, add some custom stuff like the rotary encoder or the trackpad or whatever you want to put in. There's I2C interface for your extension stuff. So, you can still think around with it, but um, yeah. I hope that's something that's that's working out, and um, hopefully this year. <laughs> uh, yeah, if there are no further questions, I have a video at the end. Um, it's it's just a, a, a speed build of of me assembling one side. It takes actually ten minutes, so it's just sit back and relax if you want to uh, want to see it, or if you're curious to try it out, just you know come to my desk just behind there and uh, try out the real thing. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Yeah, feel free to run it. Yep. Next talk is at 4 o'clock anyway, so let this run. And yep. yeah, thanks a lot.
every day, some of us every article, and you know, you get inspired by things you see there. I think it's easy when you've done that for 10 years or however long to get, you know, really interested in the super technical articles, but then forget that everybody was kind of a beginner once too and needs to be inspired by like some of the earlier things. And this talk is a student's perspective on getting into electronics and then following that all the way along. And I think that's really interesting. I think it's something we should all keep in mind, especially those of us who are Hackaday editors and who are overwhelmed by the glitz and depth and intricacy of some hacks that, you know, everybody likes to blink a light someday too and they, they can start with that and move on. So that's what this talk's going to be about. So please join me in welcoming to the Hackaday Europe stage, Milos Rasic. Thank you a lot. <laughs> so my name is Milos Rasic and I'll start from the beginning as a lot of people have already started and that's with an Arduino. I think I really don't have to go about, uh, talk about things like what's an Arduino and things like that. I think a lot of people here are pretty informed on that. And a lot of people uh, just think about it as it's, an, uh, it's just a simple toy. Uh, like my friend who's watching the recording like now, for example. But for me, while it is a toy and of course there are, uh, I designed uh, PCBs with other microcontrollers that do the job better on Arduino for just some simple tasks, just to test something out. It's an incredibly effective tool. So I just want to ta take you for a journey, let's say that. Uh, okay. Okay, I'll leave it here. Uh, should I? Is this one? Okay. So I'll just take you on a journey of, uh, of my journey using Arduino and why the whole open source hardware thing uh, works so well for me. So, okay, this is an Arduino Uno, and while it's an iconic shape, I never liked it because you could never actually solder a perf board and attach it to it. You had to get the proto shields, things like that. There are, of course, other forms, sizes, Nano, Maker, Giga series, and so on. But the thing is that because it was open source and it just sparked that so many companies started developing shields, started developing all kinds of modules, so you don't have to buy the sensor itself and then go for the data sheet, develop everything. Of course, when you design an end product, that's something you will do. But as a student who just wants to test something, uh, it's just not feasible. So here's my start with Arduino. Uh, the first Arduino I bought, of course, now it's a $3 clone from AliExpress. But the first one was a 100 euro Arduino starter kit. And back then, that was for me everything I could have saved. And just seeing that LED turn on for the first time was an amazing feeling, as I think everybody here also knows. So the way I used it in some of my first projects that I actually integrated the Arduino was for physics. So I don't even come from an electronics background from the beginning. I was much more interested in natural sciences, physics, biology, things like that. So I was a part of an experimental physics tournament, a competition, and uh, this is the kind of experiment I had to work on. So you see these ladders which go left, down, right. They're not parallel. So the idea is the one that falls on the raised surface will actually fall faster than the one just free falling. It's an interesting phenomena, and the other teams from where would go to universities use multi-thousand dollar high-speed cameras and things like that. For around $20, I literally just made uh, a couple of laser gates, and with my knowledge back then, no timers, no anything, would just read the signals like button presses, and that was it. And I got pretty, uh, better data than all of them because the tracking just, you, you couldn't do the tracking that well five years ago. Uh, to this point or seven years ago or how many ever years ago. So it proved to be great. I proved the hypothesis and it's just worked amazing. So I'll, I'll just show you some of my projects and some of my bigger projects, let's call them, that they, that I've did in the couple, last couple of years. So let's start with the, my 3D printed drone. It actually uses three Arduinos, <laughs> a bit overkill, I know, but one is in the transmitter, one is the receiver, and one is the flight controller. And here we come into the open source hardware and software thing. 
uh, if I had to write everything from the ground up, literally everything, I would have to do PID loops for the drone stability, for controlling the pitch, your roll, everything like that. I just used an open source firmware. It was multi-V, I think. Yeah, it was multi-V, and it just worked. The same thing goes with doing the transmitter and receiver, just using libraries that everybody else can do, uh, can use as well. And the thing is with uh, that open source and how much Arduino has spread around is that if you have some kind of a problem while developing your project, there's a really, really, really high chance someone already had that same problem and has already solved it. If you manage to find an original problem, that's the most impressive thing when working with Arduino. So this is how the, my drone looked uh, at the end. My idea was to make it as cheap as possible and to use uh, all of the things I can literally find around the house. So you can see the green pipes were literally water pipes, but that shouldn't be 3D printed and they worked. So let me just show you some videos of this. This is the first flight I ever had in my yard. Of course, you can see my safety mechanism in the form of a brick <laughs> with a rope. <laughs> it's two kilos, and if it falls to s on somebody's head, let's be honest, they know who built it, so <laughs> didn't want to take any chances. And now I'll show you something that uh, all of you that actually worked with hardware won't be surprised about, but a lot of people who look from the outside of people building, building things don't really uh, think about this is how the uh, how it actually goes uh, uh, the pro the whole process of developing hardware so it usually starts something like this <laughs> of course sometimes it looks a bit better it can also look like this it was, of course, programmed to do that, but it, it turned out to be a faulty motor, not something that I could have predicted, of course, but it's something that I just wanted to show that to people who actually maybe want to start developing their hardware project that if something doesn't work, you're probably on the right path because it will never work <laughs> for the first time. That's for sure. Let me just switch to the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't used the uh, Mac in a while. Uh, what is the hotkey for? Command L. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so these are the videos you have seen. So that would uh, wrap up my drone project. Uh, let's go now to the rover. So this is my second rover I've built. So as you can tell, I have a passion for things that move, whether it's a drone, it's a rover, or anything like that. This is the project I developed for my bachelor thesis as my project. Uh, it used, an Ar again, an Arduino Mega 2560 as a low-level controller for controlling the four motors in the wheels, uh, in-wheel motors, and four servo motors for actually steering the wheels. Besides that, it had a Raspberry Pi running robot operating system, a uh, head with two degrees of freedom, LiDAR, and things like that. Here you can see the CAD model of it. And this is something that I plan to recreate once again because this was built in three weeks maybe or something like that. Uh, let me just switch to a few more videos. I don't have a lot of videos of it because, of course, I was not late or anything like that for the presentation. Uh, for my bachelor presentation. So this is just the rover driving, and you can see the same pipes used in the rover as the <laughs> they were used in the drone. Uh, for the wheels, for example, uh, they were also made using uh, but bigger pipes, and uh, on the outside here, uh, you can see that the bathroom mat material works like, uh, like amazing rubbers just glued onto those wheels and I 3D printed special spokes that act like springs because it doesn't have suspension. Besides this, it had a differential suspension like inspired by the NASA rovers, as you can see by the head and things like that. Let me just see if I have something else for the rover. I also have the steering test. 
And of course, uh, why I love show, uh, showcasing this project is because this is the simplest stuff that can be bought. These are all of the these are all of the shelf components that can be bought on Amazon or any electronic store. These are the servo motors that are easy to control. So the level of entry for something like this is actually really, really, uh, really, really low. Of course, you can make it better using custom PCBs and everything like that, but it takes so much more time. This is just a platform that I wanted to develop for my bachelor thesis, and it was literally using all of the components that I could find around, and of course, a 3D printer since they have become so, so cheap and so uh, widespread now. Okay, okay. So uh, let me continue on with the presentation now. Uh, and the third and final pro uh, my project that I will be now showcasing is my f five degrees of freedom 3D printed robot arm. So you can buy all, all, uh, all lots of different robot arm kits, but either they don't have five degrees of freedom or they cost $300 plus. So my idea was to make it as cheap as possible and for it to have five degrees of freedom because when you incorporate it with robot operating system and things like that, it's a really powerful tool for learning things like direct kinematics, inverse kinematics, to actual, when you're actually studying uh, robotics theory. So my idea was with this is for each joint to be powered by a servo motor, but besides the servo motor that it has its own uh, position control, I added a small potentiometer as, uh, as the axle on the other side. In that way, I could record the movements, uh, moving the arm manually, record that and then translate that, that into, com uh, into commands that the robot itself can do. Uh, here's how the finished robot arm looked. Love the color of that filament. And uh, I went so far that even the, the two bearings I've designed myself using less marbles because it's a toy that can be bought for two euros or something like that in any store. And getting a specialty bearing that big, first, it's not easy. Second, it's not cheap. <laughs> So I know it's not, a, it's not a real bearing with a lot of people in the comments for this video let me know that this is not how a bearing works, but uh, it did the job. So it just used a few glass marbles and it worked. Uh, let me just show you a quick video of that. This is a project that I'm still working on. This is the first version with the smallest possible motors. Uh, I'm currently developing a, pro uh, a version that uses all of the motors, uh, all of the motors being bigger with already pulled out uh, position feedback, so it will be even easier to actually uh, record all of the movements. And my idea for the next movement is to actually, for the next uh, phase of this project, is to actually connect it to the robot operating system to do some inverse direct kinematics and things like that. Can this uh, robot arm uh, do a, a lot? Not really, let's be honest. It's a small robot arm. It can maybe write something, do some rudimentary pick and place things, but it's a great learning tool. And just because it is a learning tool, my idea was to keep it as low cost as possible, which is what I did here. So no, bear, no, no bearings at all uh, on this arm, just servo motors, 3D printing, perf board, and uh, in this case, a Raspberry Pi Pico, but it can be also run on an Arduino, of course. Amanda. So these are some of the main takeaways I just want to take away from this presentation. Uh, Arduino, well, it is a toy, let's be honest. It can be used uh, in a lot of, uh, it can be uh, quickly integrated into some project when you want to test something out, when you don't want to design your own PCB or whatever. Even though I have a project that's controlling my room and the Arduino has been on for around five years at this point and he's still working uh, flawlessly, just turning on and off some relays uh, with a small web server on it. So the takeaways are it's a quicker time from idea to the first step. Also, someone has had that problem. If you manage to get the, to be the first one to have a problem on Arduino, that's a really, really, really impressive thing. While on STM32, for example, because I worked as a hardware engineer, I managed to hit a problem that was in the errata sheet on like page 27, so much easier to do that. And it just lets you scale up more to advanced projects. So for all of you who are already into electronics, this sounds like something you've already known, but for someone who's into natural sciences or 
anything like that and maybe has an idea how they can test something or measure something, Arduino is an amazing tool that can let them do that with zero experience in, let's be honest, an hour or two just getting to know Arduino. Reading an analog voltage, reading digital input, something like that. It can be really powerful as I've shown with the physics experiment. So uh, these are some of the resources that I just wanted to highlight uh, because of the whole open source thing. Uh, on Element 14 community Arduino Instructables, you can find a lot of projects that people just love to share and write about. Uh, I've started writing on Element 14 about eight years ago or something like that. And I never thought about how fun it is to actually uh, write about project, but it turned out to be great. And also need to point out that I'm also filming uh, some videos for Element 14 Presents, which are all open source. And for example, you can find all of the codes and CAD models for the robot arm, as well as for the drone. As for the rover, that's something I'm currently working on a new version, so I will post that out open source, of course, when I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. We're going to take a very short break, and then we'll be right back. So two, three minutes, I hope. like you to, uh, let's see, Dr. Edwin Hu has worked on with the hacking those Blu-ray heads to do atomic imaging. This is, uh, this is hacking commercial hardware to do serious science to help keep hardcore scientific research on a budget. So with that in mind, I would like you to join me in welcoming to the Hackaday Europe stage. Dr. Edwin Wu. Uh, it's my pleasure to share my research and basically it's how we're hacking, especially consumer uh, product. And uh, I'm associate professor in D2 uh, Health Tech. And I think um, I will show you uh, my journey of uh, how we're hacking. So originally, I'm from Taiwan, and I have a mechanical engineering back background. And I work with the German Metrology Institute for Atomic Resolution Imaging. That's a hardcore metrology. And also, uh, nano X-ray microscope with uh, Brookhaven National Lab. And also high throughput uh, um, bioimaging in Japan. And I collaborate with the Danish Institute at the time. And later, I moved to Denmark and to work full time on uh, real-time cell culture and then also the skin diagnostics. Okay. And also 3D printing. But actually I'm also doing the solar panel characterization. You think what? Why my research feels so wide? But they all point to a central point. That's how we're hacking. And I will show you how why. So the first I would like to define what the heck. My definition is to make use of surrounding consumer product for different, even crazy applications. So you think how we're hacking my seems like this is kind of a miracle and it's not easy to duplicate. But actually everyone, even without how we're uh, hacking skill, you can just download the app on your F uh, iPhone. And this could be a digital scale. You see the calibration curve on the right is quite linear, so it's quite useful in your kitchen. And how we're hacking save lives. I think in the COVID time, uh, there are genius Italian uh, engineer 
they just grab the screwdriver mask and hook it up to the other system, they can save a lot of lives in hours. So normally, those kind of uh, ventilator, you need to wait for months to, to arrive. So at that time, really save a lot of lives. And here's uh, my uh, experience about uh, uh, how we're hacking during the COVID time. So at that time, I was a consultant of a biotech company, and they need to ramp up the production of a COVID test. And because any, at that time, any, everyone needs to be tested, right? Three times a day, even more. So we have um, many biomedic sa biomedical samples, and we need to agitate it because uh, we don't want it to aggregate while we are uh, producing the, the test. And we need to shake the six vials so in the normal uh, vibrator in the lab cannot work. We need the heavy duty one. This one can generate 19,000 uh, RPM vibration, uh, v vibration per minute. But you know, 2020 at the time, uh, the shipping is in the mass. So we can only get it like six months later. So at that time, we are rushing to build a production line and we need a vibration. So where can we get strong vibration? And then I think, ah, we go from another industry. <laughs> Don't underestimate this uh, toy. It gives you 17,000 vibration per minute. And we have uh, plenty of them in Europe. So I order it and arrive two days later. So like this. And then we open it. Inside, there's a very uh, strong motor and the vibrator and at the same, uh, in the one set. So I disassemble that. I put in our agitation platform and fits perfectly, powered by battery. It worked. So the production line, you can see the very strange uh, humming sound in the uh, uh, surrounding the vial because uh, this as a toy provides some more feature. So you have a different kind of uh, sequence. And I believe they mix the um, reagent better. Okay, so this is my hack during the COVID. So here I would like to show you how the hack, because um, I'm in, in the academia, so I need to show those uh, boring professors why I'm doing this how I'm doing this. So the first is dissemble, and we learn, and we have a new idea, and then we put it back. So I think this is the fun process. I, I, I love it. It's uh, really satisfying to, to see how they make the design perfectly. <coughs> but when I was a kid, I really cannot put the very expensive cap holder back. And uh, you know, the Asian mom is something like this. So I'm pretty happy that my mom didn't beat me to death. I cannot continue. And then if you are not like handy people, there are some YouTubers like this one, Jerry. He really can sample, disassemble the consumer hardware like this uh, projector and show you the pro each uh, component and put it back and it's still working. That's amazing. <laughs> so why the heck? I think when you, you, you see this is a smartphone, but for me, I see a treasure box because we have um, optical sensors, we have a power unit, we have uh, actuators, we have a control unit, we have display unit. So they are all geniusly designed and fit together. And one thing is uh, uh, important is that if we only produce one iPhone or one high-end smartphone, only one CPU, only one retina display, only one super high resolution camera, it will be easily cost more than 3 million euros because you only produce one. And unfortunately, uh, fortunately that um, the smartphone we saw like uh, really 2.2 billion uh, units. So if we use this curve, 
and the unit cost will dramatically drop down if we produce in super high volume. So that gives us uh, many benefits. So I show you the benefits. The first one is a high performance, and the second is a low cost. Uh, here is an example. So because I work with the Metrology Institute, so normally they uh, like to uh, do the atomic resolution imaging. You need to have a PC and control the DA converter, and we need a high voltage amplifier to drive the magic stone. This is a kind of piezoelectric material. You provide voltage, it gives you a little bit of movement. And it's very expensive. And later, I found out that this is the personal alarm. Uh, normally, you buy for your kids. When something bad happens, just uh, pull the plug right here, and it generates a, a loud noise. And the source is the piezoelectric speaker. So this is a uh, copper uh, same film, and this uh, the red part is a piezoelectric material. So I use the piezo buzzer, five pieces, and uh, if, I, if you buy five, it's only 0 .5, 0 0.1 euro, and it doesn't need a high voltage amplifier, and we put it together, we can be the scanner. So it has, uh, you can see it on the top, in the traditional scanner, it has a distortion, but uh, on the at the bottom, our low-cost buzzer scanner has a higher uh, linearity than the traditional one. So this is the buzzer. Thank you. <laughs> so this is buzzer scanner, and uh, not so big, and low voltage is safe. And this is uh, graphite surface, and you can see the cross section. This is the 0.36 nanometer. It's the one carbon atom high. So we can reach atomic resolution with uh, this super low cost uh, speaker. And then we check this too. And we can also combine new research. So I show you this is a lab on the disk. So this technology will combine the tubing, will combine the switching, and centrifuge, metering, and the mixing. So this is how it works. So we put the liquid or the uh, assessment uh, liquid on the disk. So we can see why it's rotating use a centrifugal force for all the operations. But you, you may wonder how, why it's rotating, we can still see the liquid moving? Because there's a one technology called it strobe um, uh, photography. So this uh, photography needs a uh, very precise uh, synchronization. You can see this is a CCD camera and this is for the flash flashlight, and this is the motor. So we need to synchronize that in very high resolution. So then we can take the photo uh, like uh, the, the video before. So we need to adjust the angle precisely uh, with a precise control. So if your camera shutter mid, uh, matches the rotation, you will see something like this. This is not glitch of uh, matrix. This is uh, when your camera 60 frames per second match the 60 rotation per second. The, then you see this. Then, then we can observe what happened. So this kind of system combining the electronics, uh, programming, optics, takes like PhD like more than three months. And we have this, this system in our basement. But you know, this system uh, has some drawback because uh, this it only takes one photo, uh, one revolution. So you don't know what happened right here, right here, right here. Because it's, um, the frames per second uh, of the imaging resolution, temporal resolution, is uh, uh, correlated to the disk rotation. So you cannot see the fast movement in low frequency, low rotation frequency right here. This is a question mark. And you know, I'm lazy, so I try different methods. I just buy the um, spy camera and the wireless power, and then put it together so the camera can rotate together with the disk. So it takes only one week for master student and lower cost. So this is the slow motion. You see the camera is uh, rotating together with the disk, and we can see the real-time image uh, wirelessly. 
without any programming because uh, the spy camera provides a very nice uh, mobile app already. So we can observe the centrifugal centrifuge uh, uh, process of the on the disk. And then we have another benefit because uh, the camera is um, following the, the feature. So we have a fixed imaging um, uh, temporal resolution, so 30 um, frames per second, so no matter at which angle you are. So th we can observe something like this. The two color mixing in the happen rapidly and uh, cannot be captured by traditional expensive system. So that's the new paper. And then the combining the uh, object lens of uh, Blu-ray head we can do like we can make the microscope on the disc rotating. So this is a one video I make for a conference. So it's a cell culture. We need to put the medium inside and also the waste outside. So traditional way, you would have a pump and uh, maybe big bottles and big microscopes. It's uh, really complicated, yeah. So we combine wireless power and the uh, microscope and uh, then become like this. And uh, the PhD students uh, really thank me because uh, they can just put the system inside the incubation chamber. They can monitor the cell from home. Yeah, that's the uh, old joke. <laughs> Okay, so then what about we combine the quadrocopter? So what can we do? Any idea? Okay, I show you. So this is the all-in-one power lip on this system. So we don't need a big motor because uh, we are driving the disc with the uh, quadrocopter. And we control by Arduino and also the simple Bluetooth module. And this is the just a uh, current amplifier. And why I choose uh, drone motor? Because uh, the lab motor is too heavy and the DVD drive uh, motor is too weak. And the drone motor is has high uh, performance and also low weight. So this is the size of the traditional system and this is my system. We can take it out with the power bank and then it will work. So this is uh, the system I put it in and uh, connect it uh, to the pad and we can set the target frequency and this is the actual frequency and you can see we have a small propeller inside so it does uh, speed up r rapidly and we can do all the lab on this work in the lab or in the field okay so we check we have a new research and then we have uh, one benefit a uh, shorter time to market and this time we're hacking the Blu-ray drive or optical drive. So this is the atomic force microscope. And we are using a very sharp probe to measure the uh, surface um, nanoscale resolution. And normally it uses uh, custom made laser and also the detector. And this uh, we call the AFM, normally called like um, 100 to 500,000 US, US dollars. Anyone use AFM before? No. And I had the idea, actually that's it during my PhD time. I was wondering what about we use the DVD head to monitor the, the probe. And then I tried it uh, for a while and it worked. And uh, we use a super cheap um, the DVD head, we can get atomic resolution like uh, imaging. And this is also in reported by the, 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 the journal so again, this is um, um, carbon uh, atomic layers. And on the right-hand side, this is the DNA molecule. So we combine the scanner and the DVD head, we can do something interesting. Thanks to the Lego Foundation, they would like to have a hands-on nanotechnology uh, education. So uh, we cannot touch the very expensive AFM, but we can make our own. So I just use this chains to Combine the buses scanner, the, the 
optical pickup pad and also the circuit board as a structure and Arduino as the controller. And to make the world first Arduino controlled at atomic force microscope. And then we can, it can be assembled by the students and they can get the nano scale imaging by themselves. So it's a kind of 100 volt cheaper than a traditional system and we can much more students, they can really do hands-on uh, education. So also Nature Neurotech, they uh, introduced this uh, technology and they became a startup company. And only within six months. You know what, because we are using the PCB as a structure and we are using ready-made uh, DVD head, so we, they don't have a um, complicated production line. So they just put that together and the user, they can assemble by themselves. And another hacking is um, using the Blu-ray hat on the left-hand side to detect the nano particles. And this is uh, becoming a startup company and uh, between Denmark and Taiwan. And also we passed uh, in visual diagnostic device um, regulatory uh, within four years. That's the record breaking at that time. So this is how it works. by a patented technology called immunomagnetic assay, IMA. Blood flows into microfluidic channels where plasma is separated from the red blood cells through a micro. So basically, this is led on this technology that developed in our lab and become the startup company. The so for the interest of time, I don't play them all. The mixture. And this uh, development got the top three this nomination called the blue in box European Patent Office. used to detect target viruses such as dengue fever, Zika, or COVID. Essentially, it uses a modified Blu-ray optical pickup to detect light that has been scattered by magnetic nanoparticles. This scattered so. light can tell us whether any target virus is present and how much of it there is. It's accurate, it's inexpensive, it's lightweight. And this is important in many remote parts of the world where people do not have easy access to high quality medical care. The blue box brings high quality medical diagnoses directly to them. I, I really love the optical storage uh, technology because they built something amazing. I can use that not only for this, also for other applications. So short time market check. So what the heck is going on now? Uh, the first thing, again, the burette uh, head, we can also use that to characterize the optical, uh, optically with uh, solar panels. So we use a laser, induce, laser beam induced current to test the solar panel and we can get the similar resolution if we use a, a scanning electron microscope. So that's my collaboration with uh, the UK University. And also we can use directly use the head and the laser light to measure the, up the biomedical sample and we can get higher contrast than the high-end optical microscope. And that was uh, surprising. And then we are using Blu-ray head for high resolution 3D printing as well. So anyone like uh, injection? No? Okay, I have one needle for you. I think basically no one like it. And uh, that's why we have a special kind of a needle. We call it micro needle. You can barely see with your eyes. So this is kind of needle. We just uh, cast the, the drug uh, on the needle shape. So you can see we just uh, push it inside the skin, but it doesn't dis disturb your nerve underneath. So to cast the needle, we need to have a mold. To print the mold, we need to use a 3D printer. So you can see this is the, the scale and uh, from nanometer to millimeter to micron. And this is a 3D printer on the market. So we found out that if we like to make this micro needle mold, we need to have uh, two printers. To this uh, high volume, low resolution printer can print the bottom and this one can print the tip. But they are both super expensive, so we cannot afford it. So we decided to build ourselves. So that's uh, there's a gap right there. And fortunately, the Xbox, they have a nice uh, optics and we can use that 
it's a cost uh, less than five US dollar if you buy one one thousand. So it's a high resolution like a, a research grade microscope. So we just move the head like X, Y, and Z, like this, and then we can print the photopolymer here. This is the Blu-ray head, and we just uh, print inside of that. So you can see we can get nanoscale resolution. We can get uh, micro um, microstructures and large volume. So when we announce our uh, publish our paper, it makes some noise in the 3D printing field because uh, nobody think about that uh, the Xbox uh, doing in the living room clocking dust, dust, it can do something like this. So we have a 3D printer built up and we think uh, central, central with uh, the Blu-ray hat and the made in Taiwan, I machined it. It's a uh, low price and good quality. And we can print Alpha Tower. So you can see this is one millimeter and this is a sound feature inside and we can also print different material in this at this scale. And this we also print. The Notre Dame is the burn a few years ago. So we reconstruct this in micro scale. So we can realize uh, all these uh, small details. And then we can print the mold for the, the, the micro needle. And here you can see it's uh, the tip is a kind of uh, eight micron. It sounds not so nice, but if you compare the similar price, the printer, this is their result. So we are 10 times better, 80. So here we can e even print the channel inside the needle. So for example, insulin delivery. So we have this uh, very small channel. And again, compare with the traditional system, they can only print like 10 or more times a larger uh, the, the channel. So it, we can have four channels inside one needle. So this is a rough uh, comparison. Okay, and then we have another 3D printer developed. Uh, why? Because uh, the previous one is uh, a little bit slow. If we need to print the Notre Dame, it is only takes 22 hours. <laughs> and you can see the throughput and the resolution. So here is the DOP, I think we can see lying around. It's, uh, it's a high throughput because uh, it projects the image, but the resolution is not so nice. And the SLA is using laser, laser spot scanning. Uh, a better resolution, but throughput become lower. And this is a two photon polymerization. It's a super expensive and super high resolution and ultra slow. So what about, because uh, they are all using raster scanning. They are scanning the laser light. So if we have some system can get a res relatively good throughput and a high resolution, and then again, up you go drive. So it can rotate like uh, 10,000 RPM and the linear speed is 61 meter per second. So I developed a system. This is an ordinary Blu-ray drive. And we just use this uh, drive to spin code the photopolymer. So we can code really fine high resolution layer and then we put another head to solidify this layer. So this is how the we spin code it. And we can spin code like uh, in nano scale uh, thickness. And this is uh, where utilizing the tracking mechanism of the, oh, of the blue blue ray system. Because the disk is wobbling. And how they read data because they just follow the wobbling. And I just utilize this mechanism to print on top side of the disk. So you can see this is the US Air Force uh, resolution um, pattern. And we can also print high resolution, like the DTU lo logo. The, the diameter is uh, less than your hair. So that's uh, pretty small. And we also print uh, several layers and like pyramid shape. So it's one million micron per second. So it's the fastest uh, 3D printer in micro nanoscale on Earth right now. So it can have uh, some application. I won't go too into too much detail. And uh, here I would like to talk about if we hack it right, we leverage a billion euro developed technology and they are mass produced and off the show, we can directly uh, use it. 
and it's eco-friendly because uh, we are not only rec recycle material, we recycle the technology. We don't need to reinvent the, uh, the wheel uh, because uh, there's uh, some technology already there waiting for you. So if we have a startup company, we'll be have a better price for customers, higher profit for the company, and easier to start up company. Um, that's a bit confused. And that's a bit trade-off because my PhD student stop uh, his uh, study and go for startup. So sometimes it's not so, not so good for my, my research. And red is the uh, strategic investors. For, exam for example, the uh, disease diagnostics company, they got full investment from the Taiwanese company because no one is using the Blu-ray drive anymore. So they, they just uh, all in and to get the company fly. And this is a very important part. I would like to search for the PhD student right here. If you are interested, if you retire and you have a master's degree and you are all, you are welcome. And I made a video because uh, I would like to hack uh, microelectronics for next generation um, ingestible device. For example, uh, I mean, in short, I would like to convince people swallow your blue uh, Bluetooth earbud to for some sensing. I will show you. health tech are doing right now on the project funded by the Novo Nordisk Foundation Challenge Grant titled Energy Materials for the Gut or IMGUT. The idea was born out of a want to create next generation ingestible micro devices that could monitor and treat gut conditions wirelessly. The project further evolved with the thought why not harness the power of everyday gadgets. And thus the journey began to incorporate microchips sensors and drug delivery systems into miniaturized pills that could sample the gastrointestinal environment and communicate with external devices. This innovative project is all about upcycling existing commercial technologies and giving them a new lease on life in the medical field. It's about creating a bridge between technology and healthcare where one empowers the other to provide better patient care. But who is behind this ingenious idea? Meet Edwin Entehu, a hardware hacker who is supervising this project. Edwin's vision is to blend electronics and science in a way that pushes the boundaries of what's possible. He is looking for someone with an entrepreneurial spirit, a knack for tinkering with electronics, and a passion for making a difference in the world. The goal is to create a new breed of ingestible devices that can wirelessly communicate, control sensing mechanisms, sample the gut environment and release drugs as needed. The research will delve into various consumer electronics, including wireless headsets, smart home devices and smart watches to find the best fit for the project's needs. This project is not just about creating something new. It's about changing the way we approach healthcare and technology. It's about thinking outside the box and using what we already have to create something groundbreaking. Now, here's where you come in. We're looking for a motivated PhD candidate who can take this project to the next level. You will be responsible for exploring, evaluating and applying consumer microelectronics in the development of these ingestible devices. Your research will span a broad spectrum of technologies and you'll be working in a highly creative, collaborative and ambitious environment. This is your chance to be a part of something truly revolutionary. So, if you have a background in electrical and mechatronics engineering, a creative mind, and a passion for improving healthcare, we want to hear from you. Apply today for the PhD scholarship in repurposing microelectronics for gut sensing delivery and sampling devices at DTU Health Tech and help us change the face of health technology. Okay, actually, if you are interested, really come to me after my talk. <laughs> okay, because we got like 8 million euro project and uh, we really like to make this kind of, because you know, gut sampling is really not easy. And uh, you, you know that um, a gut microbiota can decide how you think, how the, your body shape and uh, your healthy status, but it's super hard to sample, get a sample inside. So we are really um, addressing this uh, challenging task. And uh, we are doing not only sampling, we are doing the sensing and ha harness the energy inside. You see the Bluetooth, uh, everything on the earbud have already, right? 
and uh, we also need to do the delivery and also sampling. So I think uh, this PhD position will be really interesting and a lot of fun and challenging at the same time. And another thing is that uh, normally I do how we're hacking uh, academia setting. I have uh, issues that I have too much funding I cannot spend because I just use <laughs> just use uh, super low cost uh, consumer electronics to, to to finish the task. So my hobby is to use a research funding to buy a PlayStation 5 or make my uh, Apple Vision Pro and to test and to disassemble it and have some have some fun. So uh, I think that's the benefit if you are uh, hacking in the academic setting. And I really welcome this video. If you are interested, just contact me. So we are going to do sensing a delivery or sensing a sampling uh, inside the, the, the gut. And if you'd like to know more, we have uh, summer school. Uh, if you are study PhD and you like to learn some more hacking in our group or uh, sensors, uh, you're welcome to attend. Or you have friends who have study PhDs, you can recommend he or she to join. Okay, so I would like to thank uh, our funding agencies and our very uh, clever, uh, bright young men because you know, I'm MB background and I know system integration, but I don't know much how to code, how to make uh, electronics. I only have some ideas. So everything cannot be done without them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, come on back over. Our next talk is, let's see. I didn't meant my bad. But <laughs> Vanessa Carpenter is a hardware interaction designer. And this project is, I find it a little bit biting, but I love it, designed for the other half of the population, which, ow, how that cuts deep, but good. Thank you very much. So without further ado, please join us in welcoming to the Hackaday Europe stage, Vanessa Carpenter. Thank you. Um, yeah, hopefully it's not too terrible with the title here. But you know, there's been a lot of technologies developed for a particular half. <laughs> and I'm just working on the other half. So um, without further ado, how many people know this drawing? Come on, a few of you must have read this book, right? Physical computing. Okay, this is back from 2004, and this was basically describing how the computer sees us, right? So this weird little finger alien is because computers have a keyboard, so we have a finger, they have screens, so we have an eyeball, and they have speakers, so we have ears, right? And this was kind of our world for a very, very long time. Lo and behold, all these amazing sensors came along, and you are all very familiar with them, I'm quite sure. So, lucky for us, we can now sense a lot of things in the world. And that's really exciting, and that's what I've been working with for a long time. So we can measure almost anything, right? Um, I've been designing new technologies for the past 20 years, and I wanted to just explain a couple of these to you so that you can kind of see where I'm coming from when we talk about designing for different parts of the population. So um, I've been working with an art collective called Illutron, working with fire, robots, lights, and sound. I've had my own company called Geek Physical with Diesel right up there, um, working with biometric interaction and looking at all sorts of like biometrics long before there was a Fitbit, let me tell you. Um, I've been working at Force Technology, an engineering company in Denmark, where we developed early stage prototypes for companies, helping them to explore design and technology together. And then for the past two years, I've actually been in Iceland working as the chief innovation officer at Gagarin. And so Gagarin is designing interactive museum exhibitions. And this was a very different take on technology, right? This is very, very polished. Like, you don't see a wire anywhere. <laughs> um, as part of my work there, we spun out Astrid. Astrid is a climate change education suite in virtual reality. So again, a totally different way of interacting with technology and with people and the world and how we do that. So then finally, finally we come to my own company, which I've had as like my evening and weekend project for the past five years, and it's called Kintsugi Design. And here I'm really playing with how I can develop 
early interactive prototypes and like explore different things, weird things, interesting things, stuff that you guys like, stuff that we'd like to see on Hackaday, right? Um, as part of all of this, and I promise I have a point with all of this, I will get to it. <laughs> I have been working on a PhD, or working on, I'm still traumatized by my PhD, so I think I'm still in it. I finished a PhD. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Called uh, Designing for Meaningfulness in Future Smart Products. And this emerged because I was helping companies put chips in things, and I was really really tired of putting chips in things because it was like, how about we put a chip in this clicker? Sure, that makes sense. How about we put a clip chip in your seat, in your soda can, in your coffee cup, in your ring, in your hair, in your teeth? I mean, I have seen chips everywhere and it needs to stop. So I wrote this PhD because I wanted to explore how technology can help us to look at ourselves in terms of our sense of self-fulfillment, our sense of identity, our sense of self. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And then I found something that technology could not easily measure. And I was shocked because I've done all this work with technology, measuring things. And this, of course, is the purpose of today's talk, menopause. So I realize that there are not a lot of people in this room who are going to experience menopause. But it is really, really, really important that we all understand it because at some point, you will interface with someone who is experiencing menopause. It's a whole thing. <laughs> So I wanted to explain to you what menopause is um, very briefly, just so that we're all on the same page. So menopause is actually three different stages, okay? There's perimenopause. This can start from when you're like 35, and it can last upwards to 10 years. And this is where there's a lot of different symptoms happening. You don't know if it's stress, you're at the height of your career, lots and lots of interesting stuff is going on, right? Menopause is actually just happy no period day. Okay, it's, it's just one celebratory day, woo -hoo! Um, And then we have postmenopause, which is like an additional like 10 years worth of fun symptoms, which I'm going to tell you about in just a second. So we have an almost 20 year lifespan in a person's life where they are experiencing this wonderful magical transition called menopause. During this menopause, you can experience some of these symptoms. All right, now, who is ready for me to sound like an American TV commercial? Are you ready? You may experience mood swings, trouble sleeping, loss of libido, dry vagina, crashing fatigue, anxiety, difficulty concentrating, tension, breast tenderness, weight gain, weight loss, hair gain, hate, hair loss, depression, etc., etc., etc. Right? It is not great. It is, however, a celebration at the same time. Like we can look at the positive side and see that, hey, this is a whole new part of life. But there is a lot of crap that one has to deal with at the same time. So you might have thought, menopause, you stop your period, and you get some hot flashes. Ladies, that can't be that bad. This, okay? So I love this quote here. In a world of inequality, menopause unites all women, regardless of race, religion, wealth, or education. However, each woman's experience of menopause is individual, varied, and unpredictable, okay? So try and keep this in mind. And I thought to myself, surely there is tech for that. Well, there is, and there is not. So there was this really cool uh, hackathon about menopause. It produced a few different things, but of course it's a hackathon. Things sort of stay in their prototype stage. There was a few interesting things popping up on Hackaday, such as this nice menovest, which is measuring when you're starting to heat up and actually cooling you down. There was um, the meno play, and this was measuring everything. Whoever made this, like 85 sensors, your programming skills are on point. Um, and it did a lot of different things. It did augmented reality for exercise and stuff like that. There was also this one here, Got Me Feeling Blue, which was like a blue light therapy to help with sleep and stuff like that. But then I thought, like, let's look at what's on the market. So on the market today, we have things like the Menopod. This is something where it is you know, just a pelche element, cools down really quickly, kind of replaces the bag of frozen peas because carrying a bag of frozen peas around in your purse is just not ideal, right? Um, there is Muna. It's an AI-powered cooling pillow, right? Of course. Uh, so that can help you sleep. Um, there is the Ember Wave and also the Thermaband, and both of these are AI-powered wrist-worn pelche elements, essentially, that are measuring when you're having a hot flash creating a profile for you and cooling you down, which 
is interesting, but you can maybe see a trend here. All of this is about hot flashes because as all of us know, what can we measure? Temperature, that's right. We can measure temperature, super easy. We can make a pale chill and make it go cold. Woo, we did it, we solved menopause. We did not solve menopause. So what I did was a deep dive. If any of you are familiar with Miro, you know how insane this board is, <laughs> um, with two interns. And I have to say, I was very proud. One was a 21-year-old man from Bangalore, and one was a 25-year-old man from Denmark, from DTU. We saw a professor from DTU earlier. Um, so they just came in and tried to solve menopause with me. I was very proud of them. Um, and we spent six months making this deep dive exploration into like what exists in menopause and what's happening there. And what's happening there is that it's being called a $600 billion opportunity. You know, femtech is rising. People are investing in this. People are wanting to throw money at this area, but nothing is happening. So dear people who are developing new technologies, guess what? <laughs> Let's make some stuff. Um, so at my studio, we started creating prototypes to try and explore what would be possible. What could we create that wasn't necessarily solving for hot flashes? So all of those you can see on Kintsugi Design. I don't have so long today, so I'll just direct you there, but there's some images for you. And basically what I wanted to share with you today, what we're going to get into now, the juice of today's talk, is just trying to show you that really this is technology we're all used to. We're all used to the sensors, we're all used to the actuators and everything else, but it's just being used in this new-ish context in a minimal way where the focus is more on the humanity and less on the technology. So I just had an exhibition a couple of weeks ago called Meaningful Menopause Jewelry. And this was working with designers from KEA, that's the Copenhagen Ives Academy. I don't know what that is, yep. Um, they are students in jewelry, business design, and technology. And basically they had eight weeks and they were split into eight groups. So we got eight projects in eight weeks. And I gave them some design constraints. I said, you have to design for meaningfulness. You have to design for menopause, but not hot flashes. And you have to use haptics and not lights because nobody except for us wants to wear blinky jewelry, <laughs> right? Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about this. So designing for meaningfulness in a nutshell, this is my very quick version just so you're on the same page as me. I frame it in three ways. It's as people to people connection. So me to you, right? How we connect to each other. It's person to a sense of self. How do I know myself? Who am I? Identity, all that stuff and people to a sense of time. And then I break this down into different parameters, things like identity, things like moments of significance, things like how do we increase critical thinking, things like meaning in everyday life, because what's meaningful to me is not necessarily what's meaningful to you. And what's meaningful to you is not necessarily gonna be meaningful in two minutes from now, right? Um, and then we have, of course, the manifestations of meaningfulness. I was on a whole alliteration thing when I was writing my PhD. Anyway, um, so this was non-screen, something that's tangible, something that's based in traditional craft, and something that relates to an everyday object. Because of course, we relate really well to everyday objects. We understand them, we like to have them around us. The second parameter was that they had to use haptics. So I use this excellent library that I can highly recommend everyone checks out. It's from the University of British Columbia. It's called the VibViz Haptics Library. And I was so lucky to go and spend a month with them hang out, do some haptics with them. They're really, really cool people. And this library is just, first of all, really, really fun. <laughs> and second of all, really, really useful. So basically what it is, is it's several different types of um, grids where you can find out what type of vibration pattern you want. And they range in different intensity. You can have things that are more animal sounding, more calm sounding, more notification sounding, louder, softer, et cetera, et cetera. You can filter for anything. And it's a really, really cool library. So the students use that. So again, how can we solve for these things which are really, really, really difficult to measure, right? That's the question. Well, the process that we went through was we started with this introduction to haptics. They had to use the library. I had them, you know, I was looking at haptic labs. I don't know if the people who built haptic labs are here, but thank you. Uh, haptic Labs has an amazing website to check out. I used their website as an introduction to haptics. Um, I did a circuit python workshop with them again these are jewelry designers so i wanted them to like get hands-on with technology in a non-frightening way so they could actually like figure out what was going on um, i gave them a huge introduction to wearables and jewelry tech showed them a lot of examples from hackaday and from you know our scene um, they did something called wardrobe interviews which is what they do as part of kea 
So they go to people's homes and they actually go into their wardrobes and see like how do people dress? What kind of textures do they like? How do they organize their clothes? You know, to try and understand people. They made mood boards, they did early prototypes, they did testing with users, they did a lot of feedback rounds, and finally did th they did the branding and exhibition. And again, this was in only eight weeks. I'm just super impressed with what these students can do. So some of the things that they did were they did a menopause survey with 100 participants trying to find out like what are the types of symptoms that are bothering you. I know this is all in Danish, but you can see of course that the hot flashes are pretty high up there. That's the first one, right? The third one down, the second highest, or actually the highest, is sleeping problems, right? But you can see that the other things like pain, headaches, mood swings, weight gain, weight loss, dry skin, brain fog, these are all on there, right? These are all pretty, you know, they're not zero. Uh, I really love this storyboard from one of the student groups. This is the best storyboard I think I've seen in my life. So we have what happens when Meryl Streep is using the product and when she's not using the product, okay? So we have Meryl Streep, she is working and concentrating. She experiences some light difficulty concentrating. She attempts to overcome and work through it while she's not wearing this thing. And she experiences brain fog. And then she feels frustrated and stressed and she feels bad. But if she uses the ring, <laughs> then it all goes well. It was just really well done. They're very creative students. This is some of the prototypes that they made. Again, you can see that here they're playing with clay and paper and 3D printing. They are excellent, excellent. 3D designers, they are excellent, excellent solderers, um, making different small bits and trying them out. Uh, this was the process of jewelry creation, which for me was really, really fascinating to see because I am not a jewelry designer. I'm more of a hardware person. And so watching how they like carve out this wax and then they go through this casting process, I mean, really fascinating stuff. So again, they had to design for meaningfulness. They had to design for menopause, but not hot flashes. And they had to use haptics and not light. So now I'm going to share with you the eight projects. And again, I just hope that I can inspire some of you to think about how we can use technology in these different types of ways for this different type of context. So the clarity ring is to combat brain fog. So the idea is brain fog, for anyone who doesn't know, is when you have difficulty concentrating, you can't really remember things. This also came as a symptom of COVID, so some of you might have tried it. Um, and it's just, you're just stuck. You're just like... What was I doing? It's very much the, uh, what did I walk into this room for? And you walk out and you walk in again and you try and figure it out and it's hopeless, right? So they figured out that if you refocus your attention on something, you might be able to regain that sense of focus. So they've made a fidget ring that can go back and forth and it actually has a micro button embedded into it. So you can switch that button on and then you can see here, there's vibration motors all the way around the ring so it can give like this circular vibration sense to give like a little bit of like, again, they're playing with haptics, you're gonna see a lot of vibration today. <laughs> but getting this idea of like connecting to the body, focusing on one thing and trying to relieve that brain fog. And what I really liked as well was how they did their display. So here they 3D printed a box, they put the seven vibration motors out and then you could adjust the slider to try the different intensities to see how it could feel on your finger, right? And the people attending this show were people who are not familiar with technology. So for them, it was really interesting just to try this out. Um, and of course, they had the ring, the early 3D printed samples, et cetera. This one is called Alleviate. So Alleviate, if everyone wants to grab right here on your hands, yes, and you can feel the little place where the bones kind of meet, that is apparently a place, a pressure point, which should help you relieve pain, migraines, et cetera. Um, so they figured out that if they made this wearable, which is naturally quite tight, then it would press into that point, and they had capacitive touch on one side to increase or decrease the intensity and vibration coming out the part that's putting on the, the pressure point. Um, so again, just this interesting creative use of like, how can jewelry be a companion to us to help us alleviate symptoms, right? And again, here's their very, very early prototype. Um, moving up to a functional prototype, you can see it there in the final jewelry device. Aura, they did a different take on haptics. I was really proud of the way that they thought about haptics. So they thought about haptics in terms of joint pain and heating, right? So they made a bracelet which heats up. So it's just using resistors, it heats up. And then the idea is that of course, if you have joint pain here or in your fingers, it's definitely helping with that. But it's also something that you, know, you can put on different parts of your body as they're hurting. Right? 
Um, so again, just a really simple you know, circuit here. They actually built in a temperature monitor because they were a little bit worried <laughs> about metal heating up and getting too hot. So at least for the purposes of the prototype, they wanted to try that out, right? Um, this one, I am not a fan of this photo, but you know, stock photos of older ladies, there are only so many to choose from. So here we have our menopausal woman, obviously. Um, but what I love about this project is that their take on it was that we should be proud that we're in this transition. So the woman is actually wearing a crown. And so this jewelry set is a three-piece jewelry set. It's a bracelet, a heart, and a crown. And the idea is that the bracelet has a heart rate monitor built in so that it can sense when you're having heart palpitations, which is one of the fun symptoms of menopause where you feel like your heart is exploding. And then the little heart starts to vibrate to tell you to do some breathing exercises. And then as well, if you have a migraine or whatever else, you can pop it onto the crown and it will massage right here to also help calm things down. Rest is a wearable for insomnia. So this one is because a huge number of people experience insomnia or trouble sleeping. And this is actually the first wearable, you know, not wearable, this is the first piece of jewelry I've seen for sleep. For wearables, we obviously have the aura ring and everything else that helps us to sleep, but this is the first piece of jewelry to help us sleep. So I thought that was kind of cool. And so what they did was they actually put, um, you can see it here, this little pointed part, that points into a pressure point right here, which I'm not gonna press too hard because apparently it makes you sleepy. <laughs> and I need to stay up tonight. We're going to be here till what, two? Um, and so the idea is that you put this on before you sleep. It presses into this pressure point, and then it gives gentle pulsating vibrations to help you fall asleep. I really like their, uh, their display. They made a tiny bed for it, of course. And you can see here some of their early ideas of how it could look. The Calm Shell was a very interesting one. So they... Uh, there's a product called Sensate. Has anyone been getting ads for that? I don't know if anyone actually owns it, but I think everyone has gotten ads for it. <laughs> it's like a black disc that you can put on your chest to help you calm down. This is kind of the same thing, right? They did a lot of work. They did a lot of user testing. Their user wanted something classic, something beautiful, very Danish design. Um, and they had this user who is, you know, going through their day and getting stressed, takes out the calm shell, puts it on their chest or wherever, where it vibrates at a frequency of 432 hertz, which should apparently calm you down. And, you know, then you just do a little meditation. What I loved about the way that they did this was that they went downstairs, and downstairs at the school is a sexual wellness shop where they found, as I think we have a theme in Denmark, reusing vibrators. Saw that in a previous talk. So they found uh, in the shop a broken vibrator. They took it back, and with their super soldering skills, fixed it in two minutes, stuck it inside the shell, and voila, you have a working prototype for the exhibition. Moody's, this was a fun one. So this team really, really, really wanted to do a mood ring that changes colors, right? But they wanted to do it in an aesthetic jewelry way, so they wanted to change gemstones. So to do that, they thought, let's use galvanic skin response. We can kind of see when mood changes, right? It's not a science, but at least we can play with that. Um, so they did that, and I'll tell you more about that in a second, but as you can see, there's like a thousand other sensors in here. <laughs> and so the idea was that their persona, the person that they were working with, wanted to show her mood, again, being proud, like, hey, my mood is changing because I'm in menopause. Now I'm rosy, right? In a few seconds, I might be blue. And that's great. But what's interesting is that they built this whole system with temperature sensing, heart rate, et cetera, et cetera, everything you can throw at it. Because what they did was they designed, very much in the spirit of designing for meaningfulness, a letter that the wearer would get once a month delivered, a physical letter to their doorstep. So instead of having an app, or instead of having something you need to go through and like look at graphs, you get a letter. Like, hey, you had a great month. Everything was going pretty well, except that before lunch every day, you seemed to like drop in mood, <laughs> right? Or something like that. Or on the 18th, you had like, you know, a lot of hot flashes, whatever it is. So that you get these insights via a letter delivered to your door. And then it would also ask you some reflection questions like, is this the person you want to be? How is everything going for you? Right? So I really like that part of it. Um, this is their first prototype, which I love, you know, just some cardboard, some paper. And their solution for inside the watch to show the different moods was just like this little servo motor, right? So of course this is too big for a 
real wearable right now, but you could imagine that in the future we could play with something, right? I just thought that they were very creative in how they solved that problem. So the last project I'm going to show you today is the one that I felt had a lot of market potential. The person that they were interviewing was a healthcare worker. So this person was a physiotherapist, but she was speaking on behalf of people like nurses, doctors, etc., saying, hey, we're not allowed to wear jewelry on our hands, on our wrists, anything else. So if you make something for us, it has to be on the head or elsewhere. So the team worked really, really hard, and they figured out that they could make some earrings. And they wanted to measure galvanic skin response. And the idea was that they had a person that they were interviewing who was in her sixth year of symptoms. This is six years of hot flashes, six years of crashing fatigue, six years of anxiety. And so basically what she said was, it would be so nice if I could get told when one of these things was coming along, one of these symptoms, so that I could do some box breathing techniques. Does everyone know box breathing? Breathe in for four, hold, yep, all that. Um, to try and like lessen the impact, which has been scientifically proven. You can actually do box breathing, lessen the impact of some of the symptoms. So what happens is you wear these little galvanic skin response earrings, they sense when something is changing physiologically, and they give a little vibration and then lead a box breathing vibration. So they vibrate for four, hold for four, vibrate for four, hold for four. So it's completely invisible to whoever she's working with, but for her, it can actually help her through her day. And I really loved how they solved, you know, they went through a lot of iterations to be able to have, you know, the two touch points that we need for a galvanic skin response, because how do you do that in an earring, right? Um, so I think they just did a very elegant way of solving that, and also for their exhibition, you could just, you know, touch an oversized earring to see what your galvanic skin response was. So very creative overall. So a few takeaways from this talk today are basically that sensors cannot necessarily sense all these symptoms, right? We've got a lot of symptoms, and this is where I've been super frustrated because I'm like, I know how to make tech, but I can't make tech for this stuff. It's just, I can't sense it. There are no sensors for brain fog, for example. So how do we do that? How do we use designing for meaningfulness to design for better lives for people to help them figure out their identity, help them figure out what their purpose is, and you know, help them alleviate their symptoms, help them focus on something positive instead of something negative. The second thing is that interdisciplinary collaboration is amazing, right? So we had a team of jewelry designers, some technology people, some business people, some branding people, right? And you throw all that in the mix and amazing things happen. And jewelry designers, as I mentioned, are just like, I have never seen soldering like that. It is crazy. <laughs> um, and the third thing is that haptics are still a really underutilized area, which is crazy, because there's so much that we can do with haptics, and there's like so many resources out there, but still we're just not using it so much in, you know, in industry, essentially. So that's basically it. Um, in 2025, we should have an estimated 1.1 billion women worldwide in menopause, so we should get working on this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was an awesome talk. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thanks. Hang tight for about five minutes. Our next speaker will be up. It's going to be Ryan Walker talking about putting Wi-Fi into a plug. Know what this is talk's going to be about. <laughs> And you're going to see how this goes in about a second. So please join me in welcoming to the Hackaday Europe stage, Ryan Walker. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear me, so we're good. Um, yeah, so uh, I figured I'd get some audience input on what you want me to talk about. When I submitted the application to talk, I just like threw in two projects randomly. I thought there was going to be a discussion back and forth between Hackaday, but they just put them both as a title. So, but I don't have enough time to do both. So, this is project one. I'm building a self-destructing USB drive, and project two is I put a Wi-Fi router into a wall charger. So, if you want me to do this one, raise your hand. One, two, uh oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, twelve, thirteen. Okay, fourteen, fourteen. Uh, if you want me to do, I'm building a self-destructing USB. Drive, okay, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. Okay, more people want to see this. Thank you. I, yeah, <laughs> the only way this could have gone wrong is if nobody raised their hands for either of these. <laughs> uh, slide view? Oh no. Slide bottom, slide 
slideshow top rank. Oh, jeez, right. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Okay, so I'm building a self-destructing USB drive. Um, so a little introduction about myself, super quick. So Interrupt Labs, uh, it used to be an engineering consultancy, uh, but now I'm working full-time for a company called Microbes in Switzerland. Um, they're trying to make a packaging alternative with a fungus. Um, and Interrupt Labs is my company. We build security hardware, um, Wi-Fi routers instead of inside of wall chargers, self-destructing USB drives, things like that. Um, yeah, there's my email and stuff, if, website if you want to get in contact with me. Okay, so why would we ever build a self-destructing USB drive? Um, the idea is if a journalist gets picked up in a dangerous country where they don't believe in privacy, if you're found with an encrypted USB drive, you might be forced to unencrypt it or they might assume you to be guilty. Um, so when I say self-destructing, it shouldn't like explode or melt or catch fire or do anything like that. It should just slowly and quietly or quickly and quietly um, destroy the contents of the, of the flash memory. Yeah, so the mission uh, is discrete, effective, and quiet. It should be affordable. It should be 100% open source. So the electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, software, all open source. Um, and the CAD tools should also be open source. So I use uh, KiCad and FreeCAD. And then I should be able to blog about it because I like attention. Um, so it, it was pretty well received, actually. I was, a lot, I was surprised at how, how well people, I think it's probably, it has a very clickbaity title, so that's probably why. And it was featured on Hackaday. I, I started making YouTube videos about it and Reddit, and et cetera. So um, I don't know, maybe you've seen it. If you have, thank you for the support. It means the world to me. Normally when I have an idea like this, I build it and then I blog about it. If nobody likes it, I don't continue. <laughs> and then if people like it, I go ahead and go ahead and build it. So, um, so the, how, do, how do you know if it's the right person? So the police have it. Um, the most obvious thing that you never do when you use a flash drive is lick your fingers before you plug it in. So you don't lick your fingers, destroys itself. You lick your fingers, presents the data properly. The internet also loved this. They loved and hated it, which is, um, so I'm going to get into the anatomy of a USB drive. I think probably you guys, this is a pretty well-versed audience on how, how these things work. Um, but you have a USB, um, a USB controller. So this is what enumerates as a USB device. And you have a, a flash memory and then a USB port. So there's only really three things with some support components. Um, So as far as a USB controller goes, it's actually kind of a challenging, it was a challenging part to source because um, it's just such, it's like a commodity. There's so many of them so that you can't really go on DigiKey and buy like a USB flash drive controller. Um, I haven't done much with FPGAs before, so I, I didn't do that. I didn't have the time. Uh, and to do it with like a microcontroller, there's kind of like a, I'd imagine there would be a bottleneck between moving mass amounts of data between a flash memory and uh, like a USB system in a, in a microcontroller. So I found this website, which was like PC 300 Flash Solution Center. Um, it was basically a website dedicated to documenting different flash drives and like how to repair them and recover data. So I kind of just clicked through all this and I found uh, this guy here. So it's a Silicon Motion SM3256ENQAA. So I bought one of these guys, I bought a flash memory, I built a board, I assembled it, um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it if it worked later. So the next thing was the spit detection circuitry. So uh, those of you that are really good with op amps can probably figure out what this does, but it's basically a, a constant current supply. So through that J1 header, it's going to want to create a constant current uh, based on the different resistor values and such. And you basically put your finger on that. Uh, and then sample through that VS node, and you can determine if the fingers, the, the resistance of the finger, Ohm's law. Um, yeah, so this this actually worked pretty well. So I was kind of happy with this. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, that's kind of what the device looks like. So it was an off-the-shelf enclosure, and I designed the PCB around it. Uh, I built these in my my place at home. Uh, in my kitchen, my wife loved reflowing circuit boards in my kitchen. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so I had some initial issues with this this SM Silicon Motion 
uh, USB flash controller. So when, it plug when I plugged it in, it looked exactly like what you would see uh, if you plugged in a SD card reader with no SD card in it. So that's like the dmessage logs. It basically just says um, it's a memory bar. And I think I have the next slide. Yeah, so th this is the LSBLK of it. And you can see at the bottom, SDG, it's saying, hey, there's a mass storage thing plugged in, but it has no, nothing attached to it. There's no, there's no, no volume or whatever you want to call it. Um, so this, was, this actually took me a long time to figure out what the, what the heck was going on. Uh, until I found this sketchy Russian website. So this was a, this was a website dedicated to people uh, recovering, uh, doing data recovery as well, and it was very useful. Um, but I had to translate it all, and I found out that they use this tool called the SMI Mass Production Tool, and it was basically for provisioning the chip over USB. Uh, to work with the flash. So you would tell it what type of flash memory is there, how big is the size, it would detect the bad blocks, and yada yada, do all that thing. Uh, yeah, and sketchy Windows application, Windows only application. <laughs> um, so it, it was, yeah, and then I fired up the virtual machine, uh, plugged it in, and I actually got this to work. So anyways, kind of, kind of a funny thing. Uh, yeah, it worked. <laughs> um, so there was a, I decided to kind of split the functionality into two, two main kind of ways the user might want to use it. A soft inhibit, where it would just inhibit the, the flash memory from working, and the actual full self-destruct. So this is the circuitry for the soft inhibit. So that's the flash chip over there, and there's a, a chip enable on pin 9 there. And I basically just took my inhibit signal from the microcontroller and just ORed that with the chip enable, and it basically just disabled the chip. And so if with this, um, it, uh, it, it, goes, it, it goes back to looking like um, that USB drive, or sorry, that, uh, that SD card reader with no SD card in it. So it's kinda, it, just it appears like a broken drive. Uh, firmware, I mean, this is just <laughs> how I initially flashed the firmware. There's an upper header there. Uh, uh, licking method, so this, is, this was a, initially it was kind of a joke, but obviously it has issues, like what if the person's sweaty? Uh, there's different hand resistances between different people, water ingress, ambient humidity. I don't want to make a janky custom hole in the enclosure for the electrodes. Um, so I ended up a uh, new security method. So I decided that instead of the licking finger, although hilarious, um, I wanted to do like three rapid plugins. So if you plug it in three times really quickly, um, it would present the data. Uh, so this is the circuitry I use for that. Uh, so it's basically the first time. Uh, you plug it in, it'll sample from both charge one and charge two pin. And if those are low, then it says, oh, this is the first time, and it turns on charge one there. And that'll charge up C3 through that diode. And then if you take it out rapidly and plug it in again, that charge one pin should still be high. Um, and then, again, that happens. Uh, yeah, so this, this worked pretty well. This is, yeah, the first time, and then you plug it in three times rapidly, and you can see the LED turning on. So this, this is the final authentication method, if you want to call it. Uh, so yeah, the destruction circuitry. So this is just a simple voltage doubler. So those two, those C2 will charge up two times five volts minus the two diode drops. Um, and then if you uh, put uh, the gate of Q1 uh, above the potential of the pin one, uh, it should basically connect connect that higher voltage to the flash chip, um, and that kill kill pin is controlled by the microcontroller, of course. Uh, so this worked. I successfully smoked out the flash, and I plugged it back in and did my data testing. That was another um, that big capacitor there. That was just something I hacked in to make it better. The idea was I could have I could have fit uh, all that capacitance in just standard um, ceramic capacitors on the board. Uh, yeah, so it only actually worked once. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get it going like over and over and over again. So I kind of had to get rid of that method. Um, so I had to. Uh, there's a V2 for destruction circuitry. Uh, I actually use an H bridge. Um, I think this might be the only time anyone's used an H bridge to destroy an IEC. Maybe. 
Um, so you can imagine the, uh, if the, instead of the motor, you have the flash memory in there, just the voltage rails. And if S1 and F S4 are closed, it's powered normally. And if S3 and S2 are closed, it's powered in reverse. Um, yeah, and this worked, and it got really hot, like 170 like degrees hot. And by worked, I mean it, it made it really hot, but it didn't actually destroy the, sadly, it didn't destroy the memory. Um, so <laughs> I mean, I don't know how that happened, but anyways. Uh, so I started doing kind of funny things like grinding up matches and putting another material to try to get it to ignite. And then halfway through that, I realized that this is like totally not my goal because I didn't want to make some dangerous explosive thing. So I, I kind of gave up on that. Um, there's an unflattering picture of me. I made a video because it didn't work. Um, yeah. So, so here's the final device. Um, the inhibit mode works great. There's a three times, the three times rapid plug-in mode works great. And I figured that other people can add their own components uh, to enable the full self-destruct method. I can never get the full self-destruct working. I kind of ended it here, and then there are enough people that kind of just encouraged me to launch the product anyways with kind of this reduced spec set. I thought, okay, I mean, people are interested in that. I'm like, sure. Uh, yeah, so it was recently funded on Crowd Supply, so I was super happy. This is my first product that I'm releasing, and yeah, thanks to the community. Yeah. Um, cool. I think that's it for this guy. Or how much time do I have left? Pardon? Oh, really? Like two times? Because I can do the other one if people yeah, want to see actually, the other one. <laughs> actually, you have like 17 minutes to go. Okay, I could maybe like speed run it. <laughs> okay. Cool, I'll, I'll do the other one. <laughs> Sorry, this is probably the most... <laughs> um, Oh. Okay, so I put a Wi-Fi router into a wall charger. Um, I already did that, so it's free time. Uh, why would I put a Wi-Fi? It's it's very similar format to both. Yeah. Why would I put a Wi-Fi router into a wall charger? Um, so this is a pretty famous scene from Silicon Valley, the TV show, where they uh, scattered these Wi-Fi pineapples all over the place, and the like the IT of the conference kind of found them. Uh, they look kind of conspicuous. You have this box with antennas coming out of it. The idea for, for my, my pen testing device was basically just a, uh, it, looks like a, it should look like a phone charger. You can just plug it into the wall, charge your phone with it, unplug the USB cable, forget it somewhere, leave it for however long. It's very evil, but um, I figure it can be used for ethical hacking, red teaming, pen testing, that type of stuff. So that's why. Um, the mission, so it should have two Wi-Fi radios. Uh, it should be affordable, hackable. Again, it's the same mission as the other thing, but CAD, CAD tools open source, 100% open source, bloggable. Oh, this one was, this one went famous as well, so this is why I did this. Uh, anatomy of a rotor. Wow, this is like the same presentation, just two different things. Um, I think probably most people understand what's inside of a router, so it's, it's just a computer. Um, they, run, they run Linux. Uh, they have uh, some some actually I have a pointer. Wait, there's a <laughs> there's an RF front end here, um, controlled impedance cables to antennas and whatnot. And there's some uh, circuitry here for doing voltage conversions and buck boost power supplies. So this is kind of what I'm going for, just small down in case. Um, so this was my first go. This was the the non non-form factor board, so like it didn't actually fit in the case, but I wanted to build a build an SBC to emulate what we'd be getting. So this is the this is the PMIC stuff here. Uh, it's an, it was an all winner A33, which is a quad core 1.3 gigahertz um, processor. There's I think 512 megabytes of DDR3 RAM, uh, and then some USB ports and things to start initial testing. Uh, yeah, so this was this was actually the first time I did DDR3. Um, so this is just showing the length matching process. Um, I'm sure some of you might be familiar with it, but it, length matching is something that's done. The idea is to keep all the traces the same length so that the signal integrity matches up so you don't have some signals arriving before or after other signals. Um, KiCad, or KiCad actually has a 
quite a nice tool to do this, like a length matching tool. And it, it works pretty well. Uh, this was a four-layer four board, if anyone was interested. Uh, power distribution. Uh, so yeah, there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, dif five different voltage rails. Um, this is just the, the mid, mid layer of power, power distribution. Uh, so yes, these are the boards, um, unpopulated, uh, paste. And these are the populated boards. Um, hand bombing a BGA package is actually really simple. Uh, this was like a 200 and whatever pin BGA. Don't, don't let people tell you it's, okay, it's, it's not, it's, I'd give it a go if you, if you have the opportunity, don't, don't be worried about it, just try it. You surprise yourself, I surprise myself. Um, yeah, so this is it, this is the glamour shot, of the entire board. Um, Build Root is a really, really awesome project, it makes me happy. And uh, the all winner stuff is all, it's all mainline Linux, so you can just clone Build Root, you can take a pre-existing def config file that somebody made, modify it to what you want, it'll give you the U-boot, the kernel, user space applications, yeah, it works really well. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, that board I built, it, it booted, it booted Linux, so that was, once, once you have that happening, you're like halfway to, you're like 90% of the way. Um, uh, yeah, this is just, I just dropped in the, the kernel objects for, I think it was two, two real chat, two real tech uh, Wi-Fi radios. They worked over USB. Um, yeah, and then these are my two, two wireless devices, I think. Uh, this is the janky connection, basically. <laughs> these, these, are, these are the Wi-Fi modules here, and they'd eventually end up on the board itself. But I just plug them in through some, some USB ports that I, or USB cables that I stripped. Um, and then this, the final form factor device, I ended up splitting it into two. So there was going to be a, a power board and then a compute board on the bottom. The power board would have the high voltage electronics and all the, the other electronics to convert to all those different voltage rails I showed. And the compute board would have the, uh, it would have the, the all winner and all the other stuff. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of just like creepage and clearance stuff that is good to remember so you don't burn your house down. But um, yeah, the, the mains came in here, and then you got to have a good amount of isolation between and low voltage side here. And I actually used a module that had, it wasn't like an all-in-one, because I couldn't find an all-in-one that was small enough to fit into the enclosure. But it was like a 50% in one. It had the transformer and some other support components, and you had to provide your own big bolt caps and, and that type of thing. Uh, yeah, so this is the, this is the whole thing. Um, so there's the top board there, that's the power board, and that connects the lower board there, and there's the header, just standard 1.1, 2.54 millimeter pitch headers connecting the two. Done, right? Okay, so this is more, yeah, so this was like during the chip shortage, and so that, I, for that, those power supplies that did all those voltage conversions from five volts, I said there's like five of them or something, I use the same one, it's the TI part, and they cost like a dollar each, and then the chip shortage happened, and they were basically like racketing up the price of them and doing all this nonsense, and it went up to like $50 for like one chip, and people were buying them, so they must be using automotive or something. So anyways, the project had to go on hold for a little bit until I could. Yeah. Uh, this, is a, this is a handy graph if you want to understand the cost versus sketchiness of buying electronic components. Um, so like Avenant and Arrow, those are typically cheaper, longer lead times reputable, you go to the AliExpress, things get a little bit more sketchy. DigiKey is like super expensive but fast and reliable. And then like the, on the max, sketchy and lowest cost, you can find a random person in Shenzhen to run around and buy parts for you. Um, and then during the chip shortage, it's the same thing but just like very expensive. Anyways, this is, yeah, feel free to use that. <laughs> uh, this is the case, I 3D printed it. I'm not a mechanical engineer person, I just like, whip it up in FreeCAD. And, yeah, I, don't, I don't claim this to be some sort of masterpiece or anything. Uh, there's a, a picture of me reflowing the boards in my garage. I moved from the kitchen to the garage. Uh, reflow hot plates are, I like them quite a bit more than in ovens. Uh, I don't know, that's just my opinion. You can poke at the stuff when it's reflowing to make sure it goes the right way. Uh, this presentation was for a non-technical crowd, so the, I kind of, I haven't edited it, but I figured they, I think they got pretty excited about how small the resistors were. 
I mean, you guys know. 0402. Uh, that's the CAD render at the back of the device. So the, those are the power ports there. And there's kind of a machined aluminum, or sorry, I, I don't know what the material was there, but it got soldered into the board and there's a, a mating like that. Um, yeah, power prong, that just got ex inserted into the case like that. If you're thinking this is like sketchy, it's because it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, and here's just more, more pictures. Um, yeah, so this is, this is the power module I was talking about. These are, the, these are the bulk capacitors I had to bring on my own. This is a special uh, Y-rated safety capacitor. I was just talking about this earlier, but um, if you buy like those sketchy power supplies, um, they don't use those. Uh, yeah, and this is the this is the completed product or project. Uh, so it's I don't know, kind of blocky. I've never really seen a phone charger like that before, but I figured it was kind of close enough. Uh, yeah, and I, this this actually was entered into the Hackaday Prize a few years ago, and I, I think it got like top ten or something. So thank you for that. Uh, remarks. Uh, yeah, so I, th I think I kind of did all the things that I set out to do, so I was, I was happy about that. Uh, oh, that's the end. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. Cool. That's that's awesome. Awesome. Oh, yeah, that's in, in case you weren't noticing, he built a computer. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, casually built a computer. Thanks very much. Yeah. That's you you awesome. guys should try it. It's, yeah. <laughs> so seriously, seriously, I, I yeah. yeah. Anyways. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks very much. All right, everybody, two more talks to go, and then it's parties and badge hacking. I know if you've done projects with microcontrollers a long time ago, like I used to, the idea that you could put a screen and a GUI to it was crazy. And these days, it's super easy. And to show you just how super easy it is, we've got HP Hostrup Nielsen here. So please give him a round welcome of applause to the Hackaday Europe stage. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so let's get started with the obligatory about me page. Uh, I'm an electronics engineer uh, from Technical University of Denmark. I'm a maker and been a Fab Lab manager since 2017. I quit my job and took over my dad's company, and now I'm a full time hardware consultant. Uh, I'm 38 years old and I wear a shoe size 47. The reason I got into this touch gear FX stuff is so long that it will be its own talk. So if you want to know why, and I can show you some more hardware about that. Uh, find me afterwards, because that's also very interesting. So let's just dive into this directly. What is TouchGFX? And I think I have to go with a disclaimer here. I'm not affiliated with ST or TouchGFX myself. It's just a tool that I find very, very easy to use to create graphical interfaces very, very fast. And we're going to try with a live demo Ooh. later. Um, so TouchGFX basically consists of three parts. And you have read the slide already, I'll just go through it anyway. So the first part is the generator, which is a binary blob. Uh, we cannot access that. That's the proprietary information that ST has. Uh, and that is the, the m engine underneath anything. What really shines through here is the touch GFX designer. So that's the graphical interface. We can just drag and drop items onto our canvas, create a load of screens, and create the interactions between those screens. So if we want to, we can create the whole menu tree in the design. And that also means that if we are using development boards, like for example this one here, we can give these boards to the design department, let them do all the design while we work on the hardware side of things. And then later we can merge these two projects very easily and then we can reduce the time to market. Uh, so yeah, you get the picture that we are focusing on producing final products here, but this little device here, I think it's around 30, 40 euros. So it's easy or cheap enough to just put in your own projects like an Arduino, for example. 
And then uh, we have the engine. That is the yeah also the library here. Um, let's dive a little bit uh, further into it. Just a quick note. There is Linux support. I'm a bad hacker. I'm using Windows. Sorry, not sorry. Um, they have a guide on how to set up a virtual machine with a load of text editing, as you are familiar with in Linux. Um, but it runs fine in Windows. So in order to create a graphical uh, system, we need these parts here. And I just blanked these uh, graphs from the TouchGFX uh, documentation here. So in the center, we have the microcontroller. In the flash, we have the graphical assets such as the fonts and the uh, PNG images that creates all the yeah the graphics. Um, we have external RAM, and just to put some numbers here, uh, this board here that's uh, 480 by 272 pixels. We're using 24 bits uh, of pixel depth, so that uh, means that we need just short of 400 kilobytes of RAM to have a single frame buffer. Now I also write the double and triple frame buffer numbers, because if we want to do animations like sliding screens and videos and stuff like that, we want to have double or triple frame buffers so we can just swap them out easily. These systems want to run at 60 frames per second, and they can do that if we have the amount of RAM. This board is the old one. It only has this um, uh, 340 kilobytes of RAM and two megabytes of flash built in. That means that we need external storage, both on the RAM side and the flash side. The newest board in the family, this one here, it has uh, three megabytes of RAM and four megabytes of flash. That means that we can skip the hardware altogether. That means that we can have a much lighter design, which is faster to manufacture and it's easier to manufacture. And if we want to do this, we can have them in TQFP packages that can be hand soldered. You can also go for the BGA if you want to save space. So how does this work? Um, how many are familiar with uh, real-time operating systems, RTOSs? A lot of people, that's great. So you know, we have a task or a set of tasks, and the TouchGFX just runs in its own task. So we have some applications, we have some tasks here, and those tasks can send a message to the Artos ta or to the TouchGFX task, and we can just update uh, the display that way. So in the in the TouchGFX task itself, it will be the model percent of you uh, setup that some are familiar with from from generic computer programming. Um, so on the lowest level, the display will handle, or the view will handle the interactions, and we can send a button press back up through the model and to the through the message queue to the other tasks. It sounds a little complicated, doesn't it? I thought so back in 2019 when I started this. Um, on the display side, we can TouchGFX prides itself with uh, being display agnostic. So that means that they just maintain the frame buffer, which is a set of memory where all the pixels are up to date. And we can use the built-in interfaces like the LTDC interface for parallel displays, or we can use a DSi interface for serial displays. We can also just put on an SPI uh, display, or we can dump it into a file for if we want to do that. So touch GFX don't care what we do with the pixel data. It just provides it. Let's see some hardware. This is the 746 disco board, uh, and that's what I started out with, 13 pages of schematics. Uh, the nice thing about these boards here, they are free, freely available as PDFs uh, and Altium designs. So when I did my first custom board, I just took that 13 pages of schematics and shaved everything away. There's Ethernet, there's audio in and out, there's USB, host and device, there's a camera interface, SPDIF, and all kinds of crazy stuff. But what it basically boils down to is the the big MCU in the middle, and the, to the right there's the SDRAM, and then to the left in between the Arduino headers, that's the Quad SPI. Again, back in 2019 when I saw this, uh, the documentation wasn't uh, that good. So, as I said, the hardware is only good if the firmware works. And we can do projects two different ways. We can either start on the TouchGFX designer, which I'm gonna show you, or we can do, if we do a custom board, we set everything up from STM cube ID. How many are using STM32s here? Okay, so it's an Eclipse-based IDE for those who are not working with it. It's fairly nice, uh, it's free, and you just need to register with an email. Okay, so problem is that um, in the designer, everything would work because it has this application template. The problem is that we go from the custom side, nothing is set up. So what's important to remember is that we have a hardware configurator that will set up the pins but it will not initialize the peripherals. So for example, SDRAM, um, the links are set up, the wires are connected, so this is an output, this is an input, and this is the, 
the different data and address pins, but there's no configuration sent to the actual chip, so it doesn't know how to work in the address space. Uh, about address space, we have uh, this linker script and say, yeah, you have external memory, you have external RAM, you have e external flash, but there's no file that defines where it is and how large it is. So, so that was also something you need to figure out from, uh, from forum posts. Then you have Quad SPI. I didn't even knew what Quad SPI was. SPI is a yeah, serial uh, interface. The Quad SPI is like half a step back to parallel interfaces. So now you have four data lines and you all even have Octo SPI now. So is it serial or parallel? Or what, what is it? Um, and if you do the custom stuff, you don't get touch controller integrated, so you need to integrate that by yourself as well. And then we have this external loader, which is if you want to have stuff in the external flash, you need to download a stop into the STM32 to be able to download all the images, and then you delete that, and then you download the real program. The problem is that external loaders, they are pin-specific, and they are chip-specific. And to this date, I haven't managed to make a single one of myself. I actually ended up buying an external loader because I screwed up in my first design and the pinout for the SPI lines was wrong. Luckily, I found a guy on the forums that had made uh, a, a, an external loader for my chip with my pinout. So thank you very much. So how do we need an elephant in lots and lots of small bites? This elephant is just very, very big. So I figured back in 2019, hey, I need to document this at least for myself. So I started to make videos. This next slide here, this is just a short list of some of the videos I made. I managed to create a YouTube channel just with this. And the, the, the button two are the one most important ones. Second to last, it's a video that is one and a half hour long. I just start recording and then just let the camera roll. No editing, show all the mistakes. I have people to this day saying, hey, it's so nice that I can see where you did wrong because we did the same mistake and then how we fixed it. And the last video is again one hour and 20 minutes. You can see the number of views. I pulled these numbers here two or three days ago. And this is super niche videos. And we managed to find the, the boring one, the, the long way around. Just search for TouchGFX integration, boring video, you'll find it. So, um, so I talked with the, with, with the designers of the TouchGFX system, and I actually had one of the engineers saying to me, yeah, well, our idea was that the users would sit down and read through all the documentation, understand it, and then start working. Right. <laughs> okay, so let's try a live demo. What could possibly go wrong, right? Um, so I prepared a little bit. This, again, it's a Windows tool, but you get the idea. This is a canvas. It's a blank canvas. The nice thing about the TouchGFX is that it supports PNG files, and PNG su files support transparency, so we can layer stuff super easy. There's a lot of built-in functionality. Uh, you can see here there's just a long list of, of different stuff. There's buttons, sliders, uh, needle gauges, analog watches, and whatnot. You can also create your own stuff. Um, so if I just try and make a simple shape, a box, this is going to be my background. So the checkered background right now is, of course, transparent. So I just drag this out here, and then I give that a nice red color. So this is the background of my first screen. Super simple. And then we're going to add a button. Big deal. OK, so over in the left side, we, have, uh, we can add screens. So I create a new screen. We'll get do the same stuff here. Just create a, a nice background here. Let's do uh, this color. And then we can add a button uh, with a label, for example. So this label here, and now it says new text I'm going to write here. Fancy button. And the text here will be hard coded, but we can add a wildcard to that, which means that we get a handle in the code so we can send a new text from another task. So we can now change the text. Uh, we can also do icons, but all the it's, it's super optimizing this stuff. So right now, if we go here into the, let's see, images here. We have two images, and these are the just the button when it's pressed and when it's not pressed. And since we reuse the same button design, it's gonna be it, it's only gonna save it once. And for text, now we don't have any text here, but if we made a text field, it will actually go in and look at the uh, the letters being used. So if the text doesn't contain a G, then there is no G glyph in the graphical assets then we can say, well, we might need a G at some point, so please include the full font, all the letters. 
And uh, yeah, so we can optimize very, very heavily on this. We can also say if you encounter a letter that we don't have, please use this standard, uh, like a question mark or a star instead of that uh, special letter. So we can fairly easy create something that is versatile but still optimized. So now we have two screens. We have the turquoise one um, and the red one. And again, it's layered, so we can have the, um, the background on top if you want to do that. Now I want to do interactions. So I go to my interactions tab. And it's Sorry, it's small on the screen here. But I can add an interaction. And the trigger for this interaction, there's a long list, but I want to trigger when a button is clicked. So when I click a button, there's only one button on this page, so it makes sense to have button one. Which action do I want? I can run C++ code directly from the button push, so I can write C++ code in the text file in the designer. Uh, but I can also just say I want to change my screen. Let's just go for that. I want to change the screen number two, and uh, we can even do transitions. Let's try it. It didn't work the first time, but let's do a try a slight transition to the east. And I go to screen two and do the same thing. I create this interaction here and say, why well, I want a button is clicked. Uh, I want to change my screen back to screen one. So now we're actually done. Now we have created two simple interactions with two screens where we can change between them. Um, now, when we're talking about the design department, they don't know anything about the hardware. So they might even have the hardware yet. So what we can do now is we can run a simulator. Oh, that was a generate code. There's a built-in simulator here, and what that will do, it will create a standalone Windows application. We cannot interact with the hardware, but we can get an idea of how the user interface is going to look like. So you can see now it's launched this, um, this window here, and then I know it's not very impressive, but we can press this and we'll slide to the next screen. So we can verify that that we have the interaction that we want. And we can also see, oh, I forgot that I want to have a sliding animation on the back, back uh, on the second screen. So we can just go in here, edit to the have the slide transition, and do that to the west. We just rerun the simulator here, and then we will see that that is updated. So you can see we can slide here and slide here. So now we have created our user interface. Yes. <laughs> uh, the last button here is the important one, or interesting one, run target. So we press this button, it will compile the whole project, and it will automatically download into the device. I think that's pretty neat. Uh, let's see. Hopefully it works. Yep. So now I can see on the screen, we have the first uh, red screen. I can press the button, whoop, and it changes. And for some reason, the animation don't work right now. I haven't looked into that yet. Um, but yeah, it's a simple uh, thing. So without doing anything much and uh, without having to code the size of the button or the location on the button or which image to use, we can just import all these assets here. Um, it is a fairly complex system, but we end up with two projects that we can merge, as I said in the beginning. So we have the designer project uh, where the designers can do the designing and do some basic interactions. And then we have the underlying hardware project, so a regular firmware project, uh, just as you're used to with, um, with the Eclipse IDE. So yeah, I think that was it. <laughs> Word and Short and sweet. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, stick around in about well, in 10 minutes. We'll start up the next talk and see you then. Okay, so batteries included, check. Um, who am I? I'm uh, from Cologne, Köln. I do security management stuff, and um, yeah, 
hacker, maker, whatever. Um, and that's sort of to keep me sane in my regular day job. So, I uh, got the clicker. So, who knows where, what movie or series sort of this quote is coming from? Anybody? Do we have s two shows over there? Who knows? Anyone? 2001? No. It's got a number in it, but it's a little bit higher. It's um, Mystery Science Theater 3000. <laughs> so, yes, if you don't know that movie or series, go watch it. It's a great uh, in German as well as in English. So, um, what are we looking at? It's a HAL 1000 digital voice assistant, so much like an Alexa. That's um, free open software um, and runs on the uh, Pi Zero that's in there. And um, why are we looking at it? Well, I got a uh, printer uh, six years ago, and that started there with just the idea, let me just make a model with just a glowing LED, and it hasn't ended. It's not finished yet, but I'm sort of on the last 20% of a project, which everybody knows takes forever. So um, let's... Uh, take a look at what my project goals are. I want it to be actually usable. So that's harder than you initially uh, might um, suspect because uh, with um, speech interaction, you always have the issue of um, the uh, speech being converted to text with some er minor errors. Word error rate is uh, the, the key word there. You want um, response rate. You, you don't want to wait 30 seconds for a response from it. So um, that's where the uh, Pi Zero 2 actually uh, is good enough. Everything on device, no connection required. And um, of course, if you have some sort of skills that do some sort of online stuff, then you need the connection. But usually, you don't. Open source, with one exception, I am there. Um, we'll talk about that later. And the last part is I want it to be as easy to uh, make. So um, from the 3D printed parts, they are designed and cut up in a way that uh, there is essentially no um, hard to print um, parts. Um, assembly, there's only uh, a couple things that you actually need to solder. Everything else is selected so it's plug and play. And um, not really a project goal, but uh, sort of, uh, okay, that's okay-ish, is um, how much do you need to spend to actually uh, get one of those? If you buy all the parts, assuming you already have a 3D printer or whatever, then it's somewhere in the range of 120 to 200 euros. So demo time, we're not going to do that. Um, that was actually the, uh, the demo set up at the uh, CCC camp last year. And um, that's the uh, greatest uh, Hell 9000 presenting thing uh, that you can imagine. It's a beer keg. So um, because I'm not going to do the uh, demo, uh, I'm just going to show you uh, some videos. Um, the first one is um, the power on sequence. So when you plug in the power, the uh, Raspberry Pi 2 needs to boot the Linux. That takes a few seconds. Um, to cover the, that uh, time for it to boot up, the microcontroller shows some um, shows uh, just some animation. And there's a, a, a project where I uh, essentially ripped all the uh, the graphics from and uh, you know assembled it. So um, right now the Linux has started. You could SSH into the box, and uh, during this time the application is starting. And um, when the application is started, you will see the, uh, the glowing eye appear. It actually appears right now, but because of the music, I added the delay in here. There it is. So, um, that's actually a, a WAV file that was from the movie, um, so it's not part of the, uh, the repo because of legal issues. Um, but uh, if you have the movie, you can rip it and use it for yourself. 
And the, uh, the Vimeo um, link is actually not active yet because they need to check the uh, video if it's suitable for general audiences. So the next part is actually um, the UI. So um, the two uh, rotary controls and buttons on top are simulated by uh, buttons here. And um, um, on the left side, you have the, uh, the control button or rotary control. On the left side, you have the volume button. Um, in this demo, it just showed a, the menus and uh, started the voice activation, just like as if you said, OK, Hal, because that's the trigger word, the, uh, the wake word. So the uh, next one is about the uh, console, which is a web um, um, interface for configuring the system. Each of those uh, colored screeny things um, has a certain functionality. The first column is for configuring the, uh, the voice um, assistant. So what commands does it know? What is it supposed to do when it detects that command, etc. Second column is uh, related to the enclosure, so uh, what's the status of the RFID reader that's in there, etc. Um, third column, a bit faster than the uh, video, is about system, so um, uh, configure um, sleep times. You don't want this thing to go off at night, um, turn off the display at night, whatever. And the last part is just, you know, random stuff. So now, next up, it's going to show the, uh, the Calliope, which is the voice assistant um, configuration. So first screen, here you have a list of pre-installed uh, commands, which is essentially just like demo stuff. And uh, here it's the, uh, the event that's uh, when it's ready, it triggers uh, on an MQTT message and plays the WAV file. That's the, uh, the WAV file that's from the movie, um, shows whatever configurations uh, are related to the uh, voice assistant. So you get the idea. So speech interface, the digital voice assistant, physical interface, having all these buttons, etc., everything to, to work as it sort of should be expected. And um, little thousands of little things that need to be taken care of just like making the boot up animation and the shutdown animations they took like days you know grasping finding images gra composing them whatever and error handling is of course always the uh, the big thing in the project so that's really the main part of my project that's what's uh, also in the in the github repo but as always, you find bugs. You find things that aren't as you would expect them. So there have been and will be quite a few contributions uh, to other projects that um, I use in this in this whole uh, thing. And um, now um, you have a choice. I have brought three areas, topics, and um, their maker experience, so building the thing plus user experience using the thing, electronics, software. Just to give you an example, for a uh, maker experience, or actually user experience in that, the word error rate, W-E-R, has to be really low. And I'm talking about like less than, way less than 1%, because else it, the thing becomes unusable. If you have like a 10% word error rate, every 10th word is wrong. If you think about how you interact with a voice assistant, almost every command will have a mistranslated uh, uh, word in it. So it um, needs to be really, really low. How can we achieve that? That's part of so this uh, thing. Then electronics. Um, things like um, for one of the MCUs I use, the uh, CH9102, um, reports always connected to the, uh, serial, uh, to the um, microchip. Um, independent of whether or not someone is actually talking to it. So um, how is the uh, microcontroller then able to detect whether it's actually talking to someone or it's just a physically connected line instead of a logically connected line? And software, um, also again the um, communication between the li Linux, the Raspberry Pi and the microcontroller 
the web zero protocol so where do you want to put the focus on let me just see some hands i would say everybody can pick two who would like to hear uh, for me to spend most time on maker experience and user experience that's about a third i would say okay uh electronics uh, almost the same and software uh, the least okay so the first two I don't know if it's really gonna work out that way but I'll try to uh, put the emphasis on then the first two so user experience the boot up animation we saw in the uh, first uh, video there is uh, another um, animation that's shown when it's shutting down and um, what it essentially does is um, it covers just the time it's required for the Linux to do systemd shutdown. And um, on the uh, Pi 2, that um, animation is timed so that it works pretty much exactly for the time that it takes for the system to power off. Once the uh, Pi powers off, the microcontroller actually stays power on. So the display will stay dark but lit up. And that's one part where the uh, one of the, uh, the when the, the CH9102 chip is used, the microcontroller has no way of detecting whether the other side is actually already gone, power off, or not. So that's one part where that issue comes in. So um, instead, is there's a ping pong uh, uh, game that happens when you know it doesn't receive a, a pong for I don't remember a second or so. Then um, you know, okay, it must be turned off, gone, whatever, and so I will power down the, micro, uh, the, the microcontroller as well. Feedback. The uh, glowing eye also appears every time you interact with it. So um, you say the wake word, it comes up. While it listens for what you want to say, it stays up. When um, it's thinking, it actually uh, so computing what it needs to do or executing the uh, the whatever command it is is actually um, a little different glowing eye so uh, you know that it's sort of thinking and then um, it goes back into the the big glowing eye when uh, it uh, tells you what the result of the command were when errors happen errors happen um, it actually shows the QR code on it so just a short error message something like the microcontroller has no connection to the host so no connection to host is the uh, error message shows a QR code that encodes a URL that goes to a wiki page on github showing you okay what's the issue what might be problems and that part is also documentation so that's a lot of work that still needs to be done um, but um, the, uh, just the idea of having QR codes for help, uh, I think, is pretty good. So when we talk about errors, um, the QR code is really about system errors. Something didn't start up right, um, you know, something is not working. Now we're talking about errors in terms of I'm telling it something and it thinks I said something different. So the word error rate. For most open source speech to text engines, you actually have a word error rate of around 10%. Like I said, that's pretty unusable for real world setups. 5% where the newer ones is actually pretty good, but still not good enough for real life usage. So we need to address that. How do we address that? Oh, and this is some uh, statistics of um, word error rates uh, run against known um, audio corpuses, so uh, a little bit more than 10% uh, actually. But um, we actually um, want to achieve a near zero word error rate. So how do we do that? Well, when you have a speech-to-text engine, that engine is um, developed uh, um, in no assumption of its use case. It could be a speech uh, uh, interaction for a car, whatever. So it has a general purpose sort of setting. So it has a lot of words in its dictionaries, etc. So it has to pick the right word out of maybe 50,000 words that are in its dictionary based on the acoustics. 
what if we could reduce the word set down to like maybe 500 or 1,000, the words that are part of the uh, command set that the digital voice assistant has? And that's actually the case what we're doing here. Um, the voice assistant software that um, I picked has no um, semantic processing of what you're saying. It does string matching. The downside is you need to state your command exactly as it is configured. The upside is you have a known word set. And the effect of this is that the word error rate is essentially zero because now it doesn't need to pick the right word of the dictionary based on your audio from 50,000, but from maybe 500 or 1,000 words. And that reduces the error rate close to zero. So um, that doesn't work for all um, uh, models. There's small models and there's large models. The small models are usually for smartphones, etc. And they're the ones that are uh, built on um, what's called a dynamic graph. The dynamic graph allows you at runtime to reduce the, uh, the word set. So remove items from it, so it, it is further removed. And that's uh, what, what we're using here. So um, there are still issues with misinterpreting um, words that are both in the word set. So what time is it? Every now and then, it captures what time is is. So not perfect, but also something that happens every now and then and not there regularly. So, hardware options. Um, the two buttons on top, um, the, like I said, one is the for the menu, the other one is for the volume. Then we have uh, an RFID card slot. Um, that's actually for a side project of mine um, in which I have RFID cards that have uh, a label printed on them and my kids can uh, put them into an RFID reader and they'll play whatever is associated with a card uh, in the audio system in their room. Um, right now I'm using a uh, RFID microcontroller with a, a ESP chip uh, to do that, but um, once the uh, HAL uh, are finalized, um, they, they will be the HAL with the, the card reader slot um, for my kids. And um, the benefit of uh, making the swap is um, I implement it so that when you have a card inserted and um, the um, logic says, okay, play this audiobook on, uh, or play this, this whatever album on the, um, the uh, uh, sound system, then the volume control steers no longer the volume of the speaker on the hell, but it controls the volume of the uh, uh, sound system. Just like the other button, skip to the next uh, part, play pause, so a much richer interaction. Do you have a question? You look like, no? Okay, if you have questions, just uh, ask them, you know, just raise your hand and, uh, okay. So uh, Brickies is that side project. Um, also, I have a motion sensor that's like a five gigahertz motion sensor, so, um, so it works uh, um, from the inside, the, uh, the hell doesn't need to be exposed, um, and I use that to turn off the display, pause the uh, detection of the wake word, essentially power down a little bit the, the system. So printability. With the exception of um, that single dividing line between the uh, acrylic faceplate and uh, the wire mesh, um, that's the only bridge in all parts. Everything else can pretty much be printed without supports. I mean, of course, supports help every, uh, everywhere where, you know, you have some small overhangs, etc. cetera. But uh, technically, and I have printed HALs that uh, work uh, if the exception of that part completely without supports. So easy printability. And where I do have overhangs, like for screw holes, etc., cetera, um, they are actually the, uh, exactly like there, where they're angled and stuff. So it's even an easier print job. So as we are focusing, oh, I closed down. Um, I did have open ASCAT open, um, but I did close it. Um, rendering the, uh, the model takes three to five minutes, and I don't want to bother my laptop with that right now. Um, but uh, you, know, you can find it uh, on printables. I have the URLs later on. 
So you can take a look at those um, to be printed parts. That dome that um, where the display is behind it was actually the finest to hard part of the whole project. Harder to find something that would work for the setup um, and look nice, etc. Much harder than finding whatever software components, uh, harder than everything else. I spent probably, I don't know, I would say 100 or 200 euros just buying domes that I could find on eBay, on, on uh, whatever site. And um, then I came across it and um, yeah, that's perfect. And if you want to uh, build a hell for yourself, I have the non-printed parts, so the acrylic, the domes, wire mesh right here. So if you want, you can have uh, some. Already mentioned this, all the graphics I uh, stole from somewhere else. Um, and why is the hell actually that size it is? Um, and those are the original dimensions from the very first model. Um, the reason is um, printed both parts uh, of the uh, case uh, side by side on my uh, monoprice back then. So that pretty much filled up the bill plate. And it turned out that um, this size is perfect because as you saw with the, the open hell, it's pretty tightly packed. I mean, there's not much uh, clearance anywhere. And it just worked out so that this is the dimensions have stayed. I haven't changed those at all since day one. So now we get to electronics. Um, this is the setup. So we have the uh, Pi Zero um, on top. Um, below it in blue is a the microcontroller. The display is on, on the back side. And on the bottom is the uh, sound card. And that's sort of pretty much the physical layout as it is in the case. So. Um, the uh, microphones are actually these silver thingies over here, and they're right behind the wire mesh. I wrapped this in black tubing um, so that you uh, do not see greenish parts behind the wire mesh, so really you don't see anything. Um, and um, this is the story about why the setup is as it is. So what we do is we first connect the Raspberry Pi with the sound card, that's the 40-pin um, GPIO cable. Then we connect the Pi with the microcontroller using a USB cable. Then we connect the microcontroller to the um, multiplexer, so it's a port extender, it's a MCP23017. The board is actually from Adafruit and it allows you to add more inputs, outputs to, to your uh, device because most microcontrollers only have a couple pins and they're essentially just enough so you connect uh, a port extender to it. So then you connect to the RFID reader if you want that, the microphones, a speaker, power. It will work, um, unless we say, hey, we want rotor encoders, so then we need a few more cables, but um, it'll work. So now, how does this work? Because the uh, microcontroller, the blue line, it talks I2C with, uh, with the uh, device, and it's a purely request response based protocol. So there is no interrupt lines, so you need constant state polling to know what, what happens. So when you push a button, you notice that the button is pushed because the state has changed from the last time you queried it. Of course, you could do um, uh, not polling-based um, querying. Um, so this board actually offers interrupt lines. So you could connect these um, down to the uh, groove port over here, which has two not officially documented GPIO lines from the Raspberry Pi Zero. And um, then you could uh, just detect, is there a signal coming in from one of those two lines? If yes, then um, you know uh, that something has changed up here, and then you can query it. But, well, we could do the same with the, I uh, with the RFID reader. But um, the problem now is, the whatever voltage this system right here uses is now connected 
to a GPIO line on the Raspberry Pi, and if uh, your um, microcontroller is a 5 volt based I2C host, then you have uh, a f maybe a fried uh, Raspberry Pi now. Of course, you could pick a, a board that has a 3.3 volt uh, I2C bus, um, but in the end, because of the extra cabling and that 5 volt um, issue, I decided to stay with I2C polling. Why? Because pretty much all the interesting microcontroller chips nowadays, like the RP2040 and the ESP32, have uh, multi-chip cores, so I just use a second core to do the I2C polling and run whatever other logic needs to do on the first core. So, yes, I2C polling, but it works perfectly. So, um, I have three options. Um, if you saw the open hell, um, the display, which has the ring around it, which is where the dome fits on, um, actually has um, that part is um, interchangeable. So if you uh, use a different microcontroller, you just take out this one part, put in uh, another part that fits the housing for that, and you have uh, just replaced the microcontroller model on your board, uh, uh, on your HAL, without having to reprint anything else. Um, so the Roundy Pi is actually the um, the first chip that I used, um, and it has 3.3 volts plus I to C. Um, so th uh, that's sort of a um, working setup. The next one was the uh, M5 stack uh, core two, and its um, benefit is that um, it's a more even plug and play system because instead of having to solder the uh, the pins over here. Uh, you just have a growth port right there that you can connect the cable to that connects to the um, the port extender, but it uses five volts. So with that one, no interrupt lines for the uh, Pi's sake. And it has that um, chip that says, hey, I'm always connected. The next one is um, also interesting. It's uh, from WaveShare, and uh, I like it because it has USB-C. It does have that same chip, but um, turns out it has half-sized GPIO pins, so they are really, really tiny. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't work with that. So, yes, you could do it, but um, I didn't. I tossed that one in the bin that will end up at the next camp where I give away free hardware from stuff that I built. So. Um, the Grove to Quick connector cables, so connecting the microcontroller to the port extender. There's only one apparently manufacturer, I think it's SparkFun, and they exist only in 100 millimeter length. What do you think? Is that cable just perfect size? Is that just too short or way too long? <laughs> it's always just too short, right? So, um, the benefit of using um, the um, M5 uh, M5 stack uh, board sort of diminishes in the moment you say, okay, I have to solder my own cables because I didn't want to solder the, the pins onto the other boards. So I um, already mentioned this, the two GPI lines in the um, re-speaker to make soundboard are actually undocumented. You can find them in the schematic but nowhere else in the uh, uh, documentation. And then there's the issue of micro USB on the go adapter and cable hell. It's a tightly packed system. You need the cable from the Pi to the microcontroller. And I had adapter labyrinths before I could get it even working. I mean, I had like a angled connector, then a 180 degree connector for instead of pointing down in the, in the case uh, to go up then one to add the OTG support. It's a mess, um, so I'm glad for the uh, Roundy Pi. I actually found one cable that has two angled connectors that work perfect, so um, for other setups, you have to fiddle with your USB connection. So, on to software. How are we doing in time? Halfway, very good. So, Linux on the Raspi. 
Arduino on the, uh, the microcontroller. Um, Calio Pay is the software that actually does the voice interaction, the speech interface. It's a sort of unknown project that some French guys did a couple of years ago. They don't actively develop it anymore, um, but they uh, respond to issues, etc. So it's sort of in maintenance mode, but it is fairly feature complete. So there's um, some issues that uh, need to be resolved um, or have been resolved, but um, it's for this setup is perfect. And um, in the beginning of the project, the um, first part was trying to figure out which components do I even use for this. Um, five years ago, Mycroft was big in the open source space. Um, I didn't like their implementation paths that they took internally. Um, so uh, I looked on, and uh, now that they are um, down under, I guess it was a good choice. The front end um, is uh, the service that reacts um, or connects to the microcontroller, speaks with it, and um, it also exposes a, a web interface that uh, you could use, and you can even use them uh, concurrently. If you um, have both the display connected and a browser con uh, open, if you put the, um, the volume plus button, the volume indicator shows up on the web page and on the display. So the, um, the microcontroller is essentially stateless. The next part is the brain. This is the business logic. So when everything uh, after startup reports I'm started, it shows the hell. It um, or tells the microcontroller to show the hell. It says uh, play the uh, the audio file, whatever. Um, when you turn the volume button, the microcontroller only reports I have a delta of plus one on the left button, on the left rotary, um, and the the brain says, okay, that's the uh, menu button, so uh, I need to show the the menu next uh, next menu item. Um, the console, that's the, uh, the dashboard interface for the browser. And then um, the last one is actually not part really of this setup. Um, but what I intend is once I'm done, haha, um, I want to also make a Raspberry Pi image that you can download and um, just uh, install and you'll be pretty much ready to go. So there's the issue of wireless connectivity if you want that which you probably do because you want, might want to SSH into that box or whatever. Um, so commit up, which is a um, uh, Python-based solution to do Wi-Fi management. If it has no active connection, it'll uh, turn on a uh, access point that you can connect to and configure Wi-Fi connections. And the idea here is, and that's not finished, um, is that the uh, password for that access point is uh, randomly generated and the uh, connection details is actually shown on the display of the HAL, including a QR code to make the Wi-Fi connection. So the Arduino um, is uh, C++. Um, it uses the uh, ETL, which I think the embedded, whatever, I don't remember. Um, it's essentially the uh, C++ standard library Specif uh, specifically tailored for embedded devices. So what you can do with it is, is you can go into um, uh, fully static memory allocations. And the only dynamic memory allocation that um, this uh, runtime does is actually the allocation of the screen buffer because TFT ESPI, which I use as a library, requires this. So um, that's the only malloc that could potentially fail. Everything else, if it compiles, it'll run. So we have plenty of time, so we can do a, um, a sort of look into uh, what makes up a digital voice assistant, the wake word detector, you know, um, whose purpose is just, you know, okay, Alexa, okay, Hal, Siri, whatever. I need to now start paying attention instead of just listening to, am I getting activated? Speech to text, obvious. Intent parsing, what is it the user wants from me? Skill execution, text to speech, giving feedback. So wake word detecting is a presumably easy task, but 
you want a really, really low false positive rate. Even a 1% false positive rate would mean that um, it would trigger a couple times during this talk. So you don't want that. And of course, you have the issue of acoustics. I mean, it really wouldn't work here because of all the background noise. Um, and there are some open source implementations. Um, we'll get back to that later on. Speech to text. Um, the word error rate we already covered. Again, here's De Mozilla Deep Speech is sort of the uh, the big newer one, and Kaldi is a pretty m old one. Um, but uh, I didn't use any of those, and we'll get to why that is in a minute. Intent parser, turn yourself off. You know, go to run level zero, whatever. You know, sometimes you had there's semantic meaning that can be derived uh, given a big enough model or so, but um, it all comes down to execute this skill in the end. So um, voice assistance, every, th every voice assistant has um, a skill API, SDK, whatever, so you can extend its functionality. And um, the last part is uh, text-to-speech. And um, here is, I would say, from the open source, um, area, Mycroft Mimic 3, actually the one who's up front in terms of speech quality. Um, I haven't gotten around to testing it on the Pi Zero 2 in terms of performance yet, so um, right now I'm using eSpeak, which is a bit old, but um, runs uh, nicely in terms of performance, but might just switch over to Mimic 3 uh, once I get to that. So, um, right now, and this is the Porcupine 2 is a um, free-to-use model for personal use, but it's not open source um, from Pico Voice. Um, and that's the only one that I found that has a good, really good um, false positive, uh, low positive rate. Um, just two days ago, I, I found Open Wake Word. And that's actually an open source uh, implementation, and I'm going to try that out soon. So if that turns out to be good enough, then I might go to 100% open source based and then another check mark on the project go list. Um, the text-to-speech uh, um, software VOSC is uh, from some um, Russian company, um, and um, they're the ones who um, actually provide APIs to reduce the um, word set at runtime for uh, the, uh, the models that are medium sized, uh, so have that dynamic graph, um, and um, that works really nice as well. Because the um, Calliope uh, does string matching for commands, it doesn't have an intent parser, um, and Calliope calls uh, skills neurons, which can be Python modules or commands, um, to execute whatever you need. And uh, eSpeak NG, plus the um, WAV files that are ripped from the movie that I can't publish from the, um, for legal reasons. So let's look at communications. Um, the uh, services like the uh, brain, the front end, the console, um, and the, uh, um, well, th those are the three really. Um, they speak MQTT on localhost, and um, the uh, topics carry uh, JSON payloads, uh, the messages carry JSON payloads, and um, that is actually used also for the communication between the uh, Linux and the Arduino. So when you power on the microcontroller, it will report over that connection application runtime as the, uh, the topic, and that's actually the, the ending part of the MQTT topic that's used on the, uh, for communicating between the, uh, the uh, services, uh, status booting, and so this part right over here can be any, the second one, the second item in this list can be any uh, uh, JSON element. Um, what is it doing when it's booting? It's essentially showing that animation during boot, uh, startup just to cover the time that it takes for the Linux to boot up. And when that animation has ended, it says, I'm uh, configuring now. 
So the um, front end process on the Linux then tells it, and here we have a host to device, the other two were device to host. So it's saying, okay, configure the uh, NCP 23017 on I2C bus zero with I2C address 32. Then add a, um, a device or a create a logical device. In this uh, line, it's a rotary whose name is volume and it reacts to p uh, two input pins. And then we have a button on another input pin that's the mute button on the volume. Uh, rotary. Then start, and that actually starts the uh, I2C polling thread on the second core of the microcontroller. And then uh, empty line to say, okay, I'm configuration is done. Then the uh, microcontroller reports back, I'm now in status running, and uh, the uh, brain will tell, okay, show the idle screen, unless you have something else to do. So. Any message that um, comes on the MQTT bus that's for the uh, the microcontroller is pretty much a substring of the MQTT topic with the MQTT payload just put in there. Um, Runtimes on Linux, uh, I started off with um, micro uh, WSGI and the Python 3 plugin um, just for lean setup. Um, but in the last months, I've switched over to container-based setup, so Podman, Docker, um, just because I found the number of steps that you have to do manually um, to configure the system, things like um, ALSA audio config, um, a symbolic link for DEF TTY HAL 9000, so it's always a known DEF device, so that... Uh, Depending on which chip you attach to it, uh, they sometimes show up as ACM0 or as DevTTY AMA something. Um, and uh, also, you can um, then um, use the uh, the um, script generation from Popman that generates System D uh, services. So System D will restart um, any container that's uh, that's gone down. Um, not finished, but on a good progress. Um, the Arduino uh, runtime is, uh, well, Arduino. Um, these are the major libraries. There's a couple more um, for things like um, QR code generation based on whatever data you give it, etc. Um, not much more to say about that. Anecdotes. Um, that one cost me about a day or two at the uh, MCH two years ago. Um, CPU pin of the microcontroller is uh, what I thought I needed to talk to in, um, in terms of addressing the pin. Well, turns out uh, it was the board pin that I needed to talk to and they just happened to have the same name. So I was closely going mad and then it hit me and I was like, oh man. Um, System D has a um, service that's called time syncing and the purpose is that you can make other services depend on it to um, be notified when System D has updated the um, time uh, of the, the device because the uh, Raspberry Pi doesn't have an RTC, so it just saves when you power it off the last timestamp. Next time you boot it up, it's that timestamp, some point NTP or whatever kicks in, and then time sync daemon um, says, okay, we're all good now. The only issue is it's not reliable. It even says in the manual. Um, the, um, uh, the man page says, check for the existence of a file in slash run system D time sync or something like that. Okay, so that's it. And then I had an issue when I moved over into containers that all of a sudden I had um, wrong uh, time on the display. Um, it was showing uh, minus two. And I was like, okay, that's a time zone issue, but I thought I put in time zone adjusting code. Um, and I checked and I was like, yes, okay, so what is it? Uh, containers have their own time zone file in it. 
so it was uh, the container images were running on UTC time. So Popman has a uh, runtime option to say uh, time zone equals local, so that fixed that. So um, looking uh, at the whole lifetime, um, what changes uh, did we make to the enclosure? It really not much. The only thing I did was um, I changed a 20 by 40 millimeter speaker for a bigger 28 by 40 millimeter speaker because the, the first one wasn't that loud, uh, even in a room setting at home. For the electronics, I started off with a Pi 3B, and then the, the Pi 02 came out, I think, just around that time, and um, tested it, worked good enough, and freed up some space in the case. So, And then, um, in the very beginning, I had the uh, Pi 3B with a Adafruit FT232H, which is a um, display driver board for TF TFT displays. Only later did I switch over to using a microcontroller that has a display in it. Software, um, really the new addition is um, the FLAT. FLAT is a Python um, framework that allows you to write um, applications that are based on Flutter and can be run on the a browser, can be compiled into an Android or iPhone application or into a native uh, system application, Windows, Linux, whatever. And um, with that and th their recent move to async in Python, um, I uh, implemented the, the console in the front end. And Flat is really good at getting uh, prototypes up fast. So the, uh, the whole HTML-based front end, what shows the hell and the, the menu volume, whatever, if you interact with the buttons, that took no more than maybe two hours. So, um, and that's including all fixing all issues that I had. And it's not much, it's like, I don't know, I would say probably 150 lines of code or so. So I can definitely recommend that, uh, that software. And the last part, Popman, um, that will be essentially the deployment mechanism that I'll use once I get to creating the uh, Raspberry images. So let's go back to the uh, the goals. Um, is it actually usable? Yes. Performs everything on device? Yes. Free and open source? Almost. Maybe soon. Is as easily possible to build? Built in terms of hardware? Yes. Built in terms of getting an um, recipe image uh, Linux to run uh, so it's ready? Not yet. Probably another month or two. Then. Hopefully, I'll be at that uh, goal also. And um, of course, the, uh, the money situation hasn't changed. So next steps. Finish on my ongoing refactoring work. I discovered that I left quite a mess all over the code um, because I usually work at on this at night once my kids are asleep. It's already been a long day. And then some kid comes around the corner, daddy, I can't sleep. And uh, I'm like, OK, I need to put this aside now take care of my kids, and then next day you're like, where was I? Oh, I don't know. Let's go on. And then all of a sudden you're like, technical depth. So open wake word as the trigger to get to the open source 100% uh, goal. Um, Calliope, some pull requests. Uh, the big one is uh, Calliope is not Python 3.12 uh, compatible yet. And also I have an issue with the speech-to-text model it is uh, only loaded on the first request, so after talking, um, again saying the activation word for the first time, the speech model is only loaded then, and that takes about 10 seconds. So uh, I want to do a preload hook that where just as part of the, the startup phase um, will load the, the model. Container images, I have some that I'm not going to publish just yet uh, on, uh, on GitHub uh, container registry, but th they will be published probably a week or two. Um, Raspberry image and source script. Documentation, always the last part, is it? Um, well, actually, no, the last part is mixed language support because um, my kids speak German and um, they like uh, Paw Patrol. Paw Patrol is an English word and it, the German model can't make sense of it. So um, what I uh, want to do is I want to make a dialogue 
and Calliope already supports dialogues. And what I want to do is I want the ability to switch languages between dialogue steps. So they will tell um, uh, the device I want to listen to uh, some, some um, audiobook, whatever. Um, spiel mir ein Hörspiel ab. Then it'll say, okay, welches Hörspiel willst du hören? German for which one do you want to listen to? And then they say Paw Patrol. And that dialogue set will then be fed into the German and the English model at the same time. And whatever comes out, we'll check if there's a reasonable result in the uh, Spotify uh, uh, library. And if it matches, then it'll be played. So if you want to build it, uh, there's a complete uh, bill of material in there. Um, the um, STL models are printables. The open SCAT sources are in that repository. And um, here, container development, container compose, YAML, uh, I think it's actually YAML, not YAML, um, allows you to essentially just um, compose up and have a run in um, environment. The only thing that um, you need to do when you run it from your laptop is um, you probably don't have a display attached, so you probably don't have a dev TTY HAL 9000, so you need to uncover, uh, uncomment that device mount. So, Questions? If you don't have any questions, I have some sample questions for you. How many hours? Uh, all? <laughs> Everything counted in? I would say a full year worth of work, so about 2,000, 2,500 hours. Yeah. Do I need help? Um, really, I'm at the point where I'm so close to the, the finish line, I want to get to the finish line and not have the um, the, the extra overhead uh, of communicating with others and, you know, uh, just, I think the last 3% of the last 20% of the project I can hopefully also just finish by myself. Um, when is it going to be? I would say I'm 99% certain that it's going to be this year. I said that last year as well. So, um, but I'm going to um, Fried uh, Hacker Camp in Belgium, fri3d.be is their domain. It's a hacker camp especially for uh, families with kids. And I want to have it ready for that. So that's my soft project timeline right there. How about replacing Calliope as the digital voice speech interface engine with something else? Yeah, why not? I'm, I'm fine with Calliope, g even uh, given its current uh, development state. Um, but in the end, everything communicates uh, its state over MQTT. So all that engine needs to do is have some hooks that can uh, publish some uh, messages on MQTT, and it could be a pretty much replacement, with the exception of the admin dashboard, the first column of screens that's actually uh, Calliope implementation specific. How about replacing the Pi Zero with something else, um, which is even faster? Uh, especially comes to mind, uh, there's the Rexta Zero something, um, some Chinese manufacturer. I already have the board. I haven't gotten uh, around to uh, testing it yet. So, but maybe that's even another performance uh, increase to, uh, to get from there. You had a question back there? I can't hear you. Do we have a microphone? I just wanted to ask if you experimented with uh, Whisper for speech to text or if you think that would be possible. With Raspberry? No, Whisper. It's ah, like Whisper. Yes. Um, I, I think I, I looked at it a while ago. I'm not certain. I've, I have so many things where I'm like, oh, oh, that, let me take a look at that. And so yeah. um, I'm fairly certain that I looked at it. I cannot remember why not, but
but um, for some reason, uh, I moved on. You sure, know. Yeah. So. Thanks. Yeah. And um, why not also replace the flat with something like uh, Svelte or something? Hey, I'm fine with the the two links that I have right now, and uh, they uh, they work. So why do that? Here's another question. Yeah. Um, so how do you get power into the into the house? Yeah, the I, I removed the USB cable because it's just dangling from from the back. But uh, in the back, there's a hole, right there where your finger is. There's a hole. You uh, put in the micro USB. It needs to have an angle connector because of the space. Um, just put it in there and then put it in the board. It was in there like two hours ago. I mo removed it because I figured for that one it's already wobbly enough. You don't want another meter of USB cable dangling around the uh, audience. And so it looked flat on the back, so you have it mounted on a wall? Like yeah, that? actually it has uh, magnets. I think that one has as well. So they're magnets, so um, uh, I actually have it uh, uh, attached to a fridge in the kitchen. So. Cool. so not watching your kids at night? Soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more, more questions? Have you tested or benchmarked um, VOSC model compared to AG Impulse for voice recognition? Because AG Impulse is optimized for uh, microcontrollers and low specs uh, CPUs like Raspberry Pi H2. Okay, what project was that? Uh, AG Impulse. AG Impulse. Uh, is it really? is a software that you just repeat stuff and it makes the auto automatically model for image recognition or voice recognition. Okay. Yeah. And generally, uh, the model, just looking on the web, for example, VOSC is about 1.9 giga, uh, the VOSC model, the basic one. Generally, age impulse is lower. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's maybe talk afterwards. We, yeah, maybe um, we talk uh, later. Okay. Well, if there is no more, then um, if you want to uh, build, Come get yourself a dome, um, faceplate, wire mesh, whatever. Um, if you want to come talk to me, um, um, when I'm sitting, I'm sitting right behind the entry desk. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Clearly.